very excited to start the debate, I'm going to hand it over to Samuel, who will be our official moderator for the night. Samuel, thanks so much. The floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, James, and welcome to all of you watching this from wherever you are, whether it's on Explain Apologetics or on uh, modern day debate we welcome you to this and uh, this is of course the first time that explain apologetics and and modern day debate will be collaborating and streaming a debate uh, live on both channels simultaneously so i'm excited about this i'm really grateful to james for partnering with me uh, in hosting this and again extremely grateful to our panelists dr bart ehrman um, who insists that I call him Bart, so I will from now on. In case you're wondering, don't send me messages about me being disrespectful. Uh, Bart insists upon it. So that, there you go. And also, <laughs> Jonathan as well. I'm extremely grateful to have Jonathan on as well. So uh, just want to run through the format before we get started. Uh, we're, we're going to go through uh, five rounds in this formal debate. It's going to be slightly different for those of you watching in modern day debate from the typical format that you're used to. Uh, there will not be a discussion period. Uh, and so you're going to start with a 15 minute opening statement from both speakers uh, with Dr. Bart. Uh, Bart will be going first. You see, habits are hard uh, to change. Bart will be going first um, in this uh, to give his 15 minute opening statement followed by Jonathan. And then we'll go into the rebuttal period, 10 minutes each. And then uh, we're going to have the joy of having not one, but two cross-examinations. Uh, both will be 10 minutes each and a total of 40 minutes worth of cross-examinations. You guys are going to have a lot of fun. And at the end of that, uh, we're going to have a response section, which will also be tied into the closing. That will be a total of 10 minutes. And then after that, this comes the fun part. Uh, there's going to be the Q&A session at the end of that. You guys get to ask some questions. I do want to ask James, James, uh, how would they ask the questions for your channel? If you can kindly brief them on how they would do that on your channel, and I'll go ahead and tell them how they could do that on my channel. Thanks so much, Samuel. Appreciate it. Basically, folks, if you want to ask a question for the Q&A, feel free to fire it into the live chat. If you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, it makes it easier for me to get every question into that list, and we'll ask as many as we can get through, given what time allows us to get through. So my apologies in advance if we don't get through every one. And Super Chat's also an option, in which case that will push your question to the top of the list and want to say thank you so much for that support. We really do appreciate that. Back to you, Samuel. Right. And uh, the same thing as well for our channel, uh, Explain Apologetics. For those of you watching from Explain, uh, do make sure it's a slightly different. Do make sure to uh, just indicate who the question is to. Preferably use the initial of the speakers uh, in all caps so that our team, which are watching out for those questions, will pick them up and give them to us. Again, as usual, priority will be given to the Super Chats if there are too many, too many questions to handle. With that, we are about ready to start. Uh, we will have a 15 minutes opening statements from both sides. I do want to say, before I begin, that I will call time at the end of the 15 minutes. And when I do that, I'll give our speakers an additional 30 seconds uh, to finish whatever it is, because this is an important debate. Uh, it's going to be a substantive debate. We don't want to cut them off in the middle of their speech. So 30 seconds additional time will be given. I'm hoping they will finish by then. So with that, Dr. Bart Ehrman, or Bart, I should say, <laughs> uh, your 15 minutes starts at your first word, sir. OK, I'm sharing my screen. Can you see my screen? Sure can. Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, Sam, uh, for uh, for inviting me to do this, and thank you, uh, Jonathan, for debating me. This will be fun. Um, I um, uh, this is a topic that's important to all of us who are interested uh, in uh, in the New Testament. Uh, the question is: uh, Have most churches had the wrong one? <laughs> it's a rather significant question, given the fact there are two billion Christians in the world. And so, uh, as it turns out, we're going to have different answers to this to this question. Um, so uh, I'm going to be just showing some slides to kind of get me through this. The very short answers are uh, today, no, most Christians don't have the wrong New Testament, at least uh, in America. Christians who use modern translations throughout history, yes, most Christians have had a New Testament that is not uh, as close to the originals as they may have uh, wanted. Uh, they're not as accurate as most modern translations. It's not that uh, their translations were completely wrong. They were mainly right. But they may not be, or they were not actually, an accurate reflection 
of the originals. And so I wanted to tell you uh, why that is. As you uh, probably know, the New Testament was originally written in Greek, and we don't have the original copies. Somebody copied the originals, and then somebody copied those copies of the originals, and then somebody copied the copies of the copies of the copies of the originals. And at every point, somebody copies something, unless they are, uh, <laughs> unless they're a, a Xerox machine, they make mistakes. Uh, and the next person copies their mistakes and tries to correct them, maybe correctly, maybe not correctly, then somebody copies that, and it goes on like that. Uh, starting with the first century when Christianity, uh, when the New Testament was written, and as Christianity spread. Today, it's kind of hard to count the manuscripts. It, there are a lot of variables, but let's just say, to be generous, that there are some 5,800 Greek manuscripts of every kind that we still have uh, today. Those manuscripts date from the second century, probably. Our earliest manuscript may just is a little fragment of the Gospel of John. It's about the size of a credit card, and it's just got a few lines on it, but it may date to the early second century, so maybe 30 years after John was written. Most of our manuscripts are from after the ninth century. 94% of our manuscripts are from the ninth century, and those are the ones mainly we're going to be talking about because I'm going to be arguing that those are not as accurate as the early ones. How many mistakes are in our various manuscripts? Well, scholars come up with lots of numbers. The reality is we don't really know because nobody's been able to count them all. <laughs> but the latest estimates, some people say 300,000, say 400,000, maybe up to a half a million differences in our manuscripts. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's important. Uh, but there's uh, there is some good news connected with that. What kinds of mistakes are those in our manuscripts? Like somebody wrote the Gospel of Mark, and I'm reading the Gospel of Mark, and like, what? Uh, don't I know what the what it said? Well, of course, you're reading an English translation, but the English is a translation of the Greek, and I'm talking about the Greek manuscripts. What kind of mistakes were made? Well, the good news is. The vast majority of the mistakes in our manuscripts are completely accidental, immaterial, and matter for nothing other than to show that scribes in antiquity could spell no better than my students can today. And so anytime somebody misspells a word, that's a mistake. <laughs> so, okay, well, who cares? <laughs> so they can't spell. I can't spell. So who cares? But it turns out there are significant mistakes in the manuscripts, some big ones. I'll just give you, I mean, we could, I could give you a hundred. I'm going to give you three. The last 12 verses of Mark. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is raised from the dead. The women go to the tomb. The angel says, go tell the disciples to, uh, to go tell the disciples that he'll meet them in Galilee. And they leave the tomb and they don't say anyone to say anything to anyone because they're afraid. Boom. The gospel ends there. In these copies of Mark, uh, Jesus didn't appear to his disciples. But later scribes added 12 verses where Jesus does appear to the disciples and gives them in their last commission and so forth. The most famous story in the Gospels, probably, the woman taken in adultery. Let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. Or Jesus forgives this woman because uh, no one else is sinless, so what, what, what right do they have to judge her? yeah not in the oldest and best copies of the Gospel of John. The doctrine of the Trinity, the most important doctrine in Christianity is found in two verses in 1 John that were not originally there. Uh, these are big differences. And so text critics, the ones who study these manuscripts, have to figure out, well, which manuscripts are right? Let me uh, explain a little bit about our full situation then. Um, our earliest copies, uh, copyists, and copies. Um, by earliest, I mean the first 400 years or so, the first to the fifth century. There, we do not have a lot of copies from then, uh, in large part because not a lot of copies were made uh, early on in the second and third centuries. I mean, probably hundreds, but not not millions. And so we have very few copies. And the ones who are copying this, especially early in the second century, uh, first century, second century, the people who are copying these things were not trained as scribes. They were, they were just people who were literate who could copy things. And so naturally, they made, made a lot of mistakes. And so these early copies have lots of mistakes, and then they differ from each other a lot. These earliest copies we have, the, the few that we have, these fragmentary copies. But the striking thing is these early copies consistently 
are more different from the later manuscripts. The later manuscripts are more like each other, but they're not like the early manuscripts. <clears throat> later copies that I'm just arbitrarily saying between the 6th and the 15th century, we got lots of them. As I said, 94 to after the 9th century. These are almost always made by trained copyists. I mean, people who are, this is what they do. You know, a lot of them are monks. They, you know, this, this is their work. They copy, and so they're good at it. And it means there are fewer differences among these manuscripts. If you compare a manuscript from the fourth century to a manuscript from the second century, there are going to be lots and lots of differences. But if you compare two manuscripts from the 13th century, there aren't going to be that many. Uh, and so, uh, okay. Uh, that's good for the later manuscripts because those scribes are better and they're keeping the, the text more intact. But the problem is the text they're copying is so many centuries removed from the original text. The fact somebody's a good scribe doesn't mean that the copy that he's copying is very good. It just means he copies it accurately, reasonably accurately. Which copies were 13th century manuscripts co ma scribes copying? Well, they're probably copying manuscripts made in the 12th century or the 11th century. They're not copying manuscripts in the first century. <laughs> Those things are gone. And so, uh, so, you know, they're copying recent manuscripts. Okay. Scholars have different, different names for this later for these later manuscripts. I'm just going to call them the Byzantine text because they're, uh, they're, they come out of the Byzantine Empire, the eastern part of what used to be the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. And so that's, they typically call these Greek manuscripts the Byzantine text. In the 19th century, it was realized that there are problems with the, uh, with the Byzantine uh, text. Um, there were uh, early manuscripts that were being discovered in the 19th century. There were some manuscripts discovered before, of course, manuscripts were discovered before this, but in the 19th century, they started uncovering some pretty early manuscripts. Um, uh, and they started realizing that, in fact, these early manuscripts uh, are really different from what they were used to reading in their Bibles. The Bibles in the 19th century, just to pick the 19th, just to pick on the 19th century, the, the Bibles in the 19th century were uh, largely based on the Byzantine text. The, the English translations of the Bible were based on the Byzantine text for the most part. Um, and scholars started finding earlier manuscripts from the ones based on the Byzantine manuscripts. And they started noticing that these earlier manuscripts were different in key ways. For example, they didn't have the the couple of the oldest didn't have the last 12 verses of Mark. And they didn't have the story of the woman taken in adultery. And in fact, if you catalog all of the differences between the Byzantine text and the kinds of text you found earlier, none of these early manuscripts seem to have the Byzantine text. Huh, that's weird. These early uh, manuscripts then were different from each other which means probably their scribes are not being as scrupulous as they could have been. Uh, but yeah, so uh, that's the problem. Uh, the dominant explanation for over a century for what happened was this. Early in Christianity, the copies are being copied. Somebody makes a copy, makes a mistake, the next person copies that copy and makes a mistake and copies the mistake and then makes mistakes of their own. The next one copies that one, makes copies the mistake of the mistake of the mistake. And you get these mistakes proliferating that proliferate until someone says, you know, the guy before me made a mistake. <laughs> and he tries to correct the mistake. But he's not sure what the correct correction is. And so sometimes he corrects it incorrectly. And so you got a, the original text, you have the correction, then you have a mistake in correction. And it goes on like that. And so these early manuscripts are different from each other, but what ends up happening is the text gets standardized. As Christianity starts spreading throughout the empire, Bibles start getting copied more and more. The Bible gets circulated more and more, and people get accustomed to the way the majority of these Bibles look. And so they're accustomed to how verses read. They're accustomed to seeing the last 12 verses of Mark. They're accustomed to seeing the, the woman taken in adultery. They're accustomed to these differences in the Byzantine text. And so when scribes are copying a manuscript and they come across a manuscript that has an older reading, they think, well, that doesn't sound right. And so they change it to what they're familiar with. This person left out the story of the woman taking an adultery. That's my favorite story. I'm going to stick that in there. Well, the text ends up getting standardized. Um, 
probably sort of in the, in the early Middle Ages to give a rough date to it. There are similar forms of the, similar forms of the text to the Byzantine text start showing up um, at the end of the fourth century. Not, not so much in manuscripts, but there are some church fathers who quote the New Testament who quote it in the form of text that later became standardized. And it became standard over time, and it became dominant in later centuries. Just as the King James Version got standard throughout the English world, even though it wasn't the first translation, these various versions got standardized and everybody just kind of adopted their manuscripts to this Byzantine version. And so virtually all the later copyists who produced our 94% of our manuscripts copied the standardized text, not any of the earlier texts. The, uh, the typical view today, the dominant explanation, is that this Byzantine form of the text is not closest to the original. It contains lots and lots of differences from the original. Most people read the Byzantine text, and so uh, when translations were made, translations were made of the Byzantine text. And so most Christians have read this text that is not particularly accurate. Uh, that all started changing at the end of the 19th century, as they realized that, in fact, the older manuscripts probably present a more accurate text. Here's some of the evidence that the Byzantine text, the later text that most uh, people copied and that most people read and that then were based for the trans, that that form of the text is probably not accurate. First, it's not in any of the earliest manuscripts, period. If you take the manuscripts up to the year uh, 400, you don't find the Byzantine text. You find different text forms. It's not in any of the quotations of the church fathers. So, there, uh, one way that textual scholars go about deciding what the oldest form of the text is or the, what the original text was is they've got these manuscripts, of course, but they wonder, well, you know, is there some other evidence? And yes, church fathers starting in the second century started quoting the New Testament and they quoted a lot. Uh, some of them quoted a whole lot. And what's striking is the church fathers in the second and the third and the early fourth century never quote the Byzantine text in the text form that it came down to us in the Middle Ages. You can make your list of church fathers from the second. Here's an arbitrary list I just came up with off the cuff because I know about these authors. Irenaeus, end of the second century, doesn't have the Byzantine text. Tertullian, beginning of the third century, doesn't have the Byzantine text. Clement of Alexandria, end of the third century, doesn't have the Byzantine text. These have all been analyzed, by the way. Origen, oh my God, does not have the Byzantine text, the most famous theologian in the early church. Gregory of Nyssa doesn't have it. Ba Basil the Great doesn't have it. Didymus the Blind, I wrote my dissertation on him. He doesn't have it. Athanasius, most important theologian, <laughs> arguably before, he, he doesn't have it. Pick your father, they don't have it. Why? Because it didn't exist. Not only the church fathers, but our early versions. The Bible was translated not only in modern languages in modern times, but in ancient times. It's translated in, uh, into Latin. Our oldest Latin manuscripts don't have the Byzantine text. It was translated into Syriac. The oldest Syriac manuscripts don't have the Byzantine text. It was translated into Coptic. The oldest Coptic manuscripts don't have the Byzantine text. This is not the early text. Why is it not the early text? Because it's not, it's not the text that goes back to the originals. The Byzantine text is a later standardization. A later standardization that, of course, became popular. Everybody knew it, but that didn't make it original. The original text is found in the writings of the early manuscripts and the early fathers and the, uh, uh, and the early versions. And so there's a resulting con concession. The Byzantine text form, which lies behind the King James Version, is a later and run reliable guide to the original text of the New Testament. How broad is the cons this consensus? <laughs> it is massively broad. I, uh, I go to the Society of Biblical Literature meeting every year. They have eight to 12 sessions on New Testament textual criticism. I've been doing this since 1983. I've never heard a debate in the Society of Biblical Literature at this meeting on this topic, because this is simply what the evidence points to, and almost everybody agrees with it. Okay, thank you very much. Time's up. Thank you. Thank you for that opening statement, Bart. That was very enlightening. And uh, yeah, since uh, uh, Bart crossed uh, the time by about uh, five seconds, um, <laughs> 15 minutes, 35 oh. seconds. <laughs> That's pretty good. I would say yeah, that. But I gave penalized. Yeah, so, 
No, we're not going to get penalized, but I will award you another five seconds, additional five seconds as well, uh, Jonathan, when you go. So with Start that, with the first words. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> well, uh, with that, uh, we do go to Jonathan for his 15-minute opening statement. Uh, the time starts whenever you're ready, Jonathan. In the ancient world, the physical transfer, control, and transmission of a common text results in echoes of extrinsic evidence. The document's historical formation, integration, and standardization leave behind archival fingerprints that we can examine. If someone wishes to responsibly posit or allege that a physical text came into being and was brought into public notice, they must indicate the source, supply relevant evidence, and provide actual mechanisms that lend to a naturalistic explanation for the creation and integration of the text. Presuming Dr. Ehrman's assertion that the ecclesiastical text, namely the Syrian Byzantium text form, is a later text form relegating its status as secondary, then we would expect to see the following body of evidence to support these conclusions. Observe, the Homeric texts were not created ex nihilo. Instead, they are the product of a purposeful historical process. These texts were initiated and organized by a certain individual and a group of individuals at a certain time in a certain place from those who were, in, uh, were able to undertake such a project and achieve its desired end. In the art of grammar, a late antique commentary from second century BC Homeric scholar Diognetius Strax, we find the following. There was a time when the Homeric poems were lost. The cause was due either to fire, the influx of water, or a result of an earthquake. And after the scrolls had been scattered in many directions and become extinct, it turned out that one person happened to keep a hundred Homeric verses, another a thousand, yet another 200, and someone else as much as he happened to have. Being in a state such as this, Homer's poetry was about to sink into oblivion. Yet Pisistratus, an Athenian leader wishing both to acquire fame for himself and to restore the poems of Homer, initiated the following. He announced through the whole of Greece that those who have Homeric verses should bring them to him, a fixed price having been established for each verse. And after having collected all the verses, he summoned 72 learned men in order that each of them should independently assemble the Homeric poems in the way that seems best to him. And when each of them assembled the poems according to his best judgment, he convened all the said learned men in one place. Diognetius' text provides the world with the comprehensive history that details the creation and standardization of the Homeric text under the Archon of Athens, Pisistratus, in the sixth century BC. It provides objective evidence of the text's editorialization and showcases how even at this early point in history, material traces of such endeavors were meticulously recorded. By delving deeper into the history of the Homeric texts, we become capable of discerning how these texts became popularized and dispersed throughout Athenian society. In fact, the famed orator Lycurgus informs us that the forefathers of the Athenians implemented a law that Homer's text should be rhapsodized at the four yearly Panathea. This tradition upheld by the government of Athens serves to solidify how the Homeric texts were integrated into the society's celebratory holidays and made a permanent fixture. Finally, the regularization and canonization of the Homeric texts reached its highest point during the third and second centuries BC in Potomac Alexandria. Xenidus, Aristophanes, Aristius, and other representatives of the Alexandrian school saw their task as the restoration of the original works of Homer. In turn, these scholars produced the first critical editions and commentaries on the Homeric texts. Due to the abundance of historical evidence, it is difficult to contest the facts for the textual history of the Homeric texts in that the poems were first subject to processing in Athens during the reign of Pisistratus when they were previously confused and then critical editions were produced at the Library of Alexandria. This history is established by the uniform testimony of so many men in so many times, as evinced in the writings of Cicero, Hippocarus, Duichides, Escapolis, and Pausinius. 
Certainly, thorough testimony of this nature should be recognized and given the credit and authority of common history. However, Dr. Ehrman's proposed explanation for how the ecclesiastical text came to be leaves much to the imagination. For the historical data points we should expect to see, reminiscent of our findings for the Homeric texts, are not embodied within Dr. Ehrman's narrative. This naturally begs the following question. Did such a process ever come to pass? Considering Dr. Ehrman's position is devoid of an actualized epicenter and junction like Athens for the initiation and development of the text. Second, Dr. Ehrman's formula has no pisistratus, the theoretical mechanism needed to orchestrate and standardize the text, given that this school of thought has abandoned its original claims of evolution and Robola revision. Third, Dr. Ehrman's theory neglects to explain why the assimilation of a secondary text form throughout the divine liturgy of the Greek and Aramaic ecclesiastical institutions did not materialize into a series of disruptions in the state of affairs, which is characteristic of such a process as the history of Jerome Vulgate attests to. Fourth, Dr. Ehrman's arguments do not contain any testimonial evidence from any ancient writer of any time period to demonstrate concrete knowledge of an editorialization process taking place in the Greek Orthodox churches prior to 1904, or document a work of attempted criticism for the Aramaic churches, apart from the reconciliation projects of the Flokian and Harklian. Finally, Dr. Ehrman has yet to explain how a long, slow process spread out over many centuries, as well as over a wide geographical area, and involving a multitude of copyists who often knew nothing of the state of the text outside their own monasteries or scriptoria could achieve this widespread uniformity exhibited in the Syrian Byzantium text form out of the diversity presented by the earlier forms of the text. This extraordinary hypothesis originally proposed by Kenyon and now cited by Watchell, Gurry, uh, Ehrman and Parker violates the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy increases over time, a process apparent in the transmission of the Homeric poems, which led to a state of confusion and extinction preceding the time of Pisistratus, not standardization. Ultimately, this school of thought is undermined by a key immovable obstacle in that since the development of these theories in the late 18th century, beginning with the scholarship of Griesbach, Lachman, Tregelis, and Hort, this academic field has yet to historically substantiate its theories for the creation of the Syrian Byzantium text form. This is the dilemma. The fundamental theory representing the bedrock of their study is in actuality their Achilles heel. Klaus Wachel has previously conceded this point despite the advocacy of his conclusions when he tells us a central problem of New Testament textual research is still the genesis of the Byzantium text. Kurt and Barbara Alon go on to echo this idea, maintaining that no adequate history has yet been written of the Byzantium text. And notably, Michael Holmes concurs with this assessment in his 1995 systematic essay, which epitomizes the state of investigation as follows. It is not the eclectic method that is at fault, but our lack of a coherent view of the transmission of the text. Watchell and Strutwolf have made it a point to emphasize that questions of significance have been neglected in the study of the New Testament textual criticism, namely the historical transmission in the framework of Christian culture, the ecclesiastical polity, and the theological influences that affected it, which has contributed to its incoherent view. Furthermore, this field has yet to factor into its examinations that Christians were not granted legal status until the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, and how that information impedes their understanding of the text during the first three centuries. According to Levy, foreign religious ceremonies against the state religion of Rome were deemed unlawful, which explains Pliny's report of Christians meeting secretly in their homes to worship opposed to publicly at the temples, hence Pliny's edict outlawing Christians' assembly in accordance with Trajan's policy. 
The prefect Ruxus interrogation of Justin at his trial reveals that the empire was not only searching out Christians, but their texts as well. Therefore, the natural consequences of the empire's policy towards the Christians unquestionably impairs our ability to identify the official form of the text read in the congregations until the fourth century, considering Christians would not have been forthcoming to openly advertise it. However, Bishop Irenaeus in Gaul and Tertullian at Carthage risked exposure at the end of the second century to respond specifically against the textual claims of Marcion, thus opening our understanding on the ecclesiastical polity and its application to text criticism. The polity explains how the churches were set up and organized. It also establishes a legal chain of custody for the transmission of the New Testament text via the succession of bishops. Essentially, the transfer and control procedures to safeguard the text against tampering to preserve the evidence. While these churches are not immune to error or foul play, neither their succession lists or texts, the culmination of different churches across a wide geographical area in many languages provides an objective criteria to examine the differences and consensus in the received texts of the apostolic churches. It was this polity that Irenaeus and Tertullian appealed to in ruling out Marcion shorter, yet not better texts by demonstrating that the text form represented in the primary Greek, Latin, and Aramaic apostolic churches are the successor of copies with the same character and type dating back to the originals, which witness against Marcion's edition. The testimonies of Tertullian and Irenaeus establish a clear procedural precedent for the study of New Testament textual criticism, in that only texts received by and read in the apostolic churches have standing, not texts of unknown provenance. Consequently, as we turn to the fourth century, when Christianity gained legal status and its metaphorical doors began to open, we must conclude that the form of the text publicly read at Antioch in 385 by a member of the clergy Chrysostom from the oldest surviving Greek church dating back to Peter is undoubtedly a faithful representative of the same character and type used by Bishop Ignatius in 85 AD, barring scribal mistakes and political considerations. It cannot be a coincidence that this text form appears almost universally throughout the Greek Orthodox world at the end of the fourth century, according to Miller and Bergen, being predominantly witnessed by the Cappadocian bishops in St. Basil, as well as the two St. Gregories, chief figures in the establishment of the Nicene Constantinople Creed. This is a testament of the apostolic polity. The same phenomenon is to be found true in the Aramaic churches. How else do we explain the existence of the Peshitta in the Palestinian, Syrian Orthodox, Marianite, Assyrian, and Malachite apostolic churches unless it was there from the beginning as West Court originally conceded? Eusebius's history supports Thaddeus' missionary work in Edessa on orders from Thomas, and the documents Eusebius finds at the record office in Edessa shows that Christianity had support from the nobility. In the West, we can lay a proper foundation for the Latin Vulgate as an independent, authoritative, ancient witness of the Greek originals. Jerome's testimony establishes knowledge of the matter. In his letter to Pope Damascus, he writes, his Latin translation was revised in comparison with only old Greek manuscripts. And his letter to Marcella affirms the object of his revision had been to restore the Latin to the original form of the Greek originals. Moreover, the project was sanctioned by the Church of Rome and Augustine, along with the North African bishops, vetted Jerome's gospel against Greek texts and found no objective, thereby confirming the methodology. In conclusion, why not accept the apostolic polity as described in the writings of Irenaeus, Tertullian, Eusebius, Augustine, and other ancient witnesses, which demonstrates that the form of the texts that have prevailed from the fourth century on down through the late Middle Ages, as in the Greek, Latin, and Aramaic apostolic churches, are the successor of copies of the same character, which went back before it to the originals, making it the best representatives of the earlier forms of the New Testament. 
Uh, with that, I can see my time over to Dr. Airman. Well, thank you for that, uh, John, uh, Jonathan, for your opening statement. Uh, with that, we're done with the opening statement from both sides. We now are going to go into the rebuttal period, and uh, Dr. Abad will go first with uh, his 10-minute rebuttal at his first word. <laughs> oh, is, is Bart on mute? Oh, I think you're muted. You're muted. Too bad. I just gave his real zinger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we missed Rat. this. Rat. Now, now I forgot it. Okay, well... <laughs> Um, okay, well, thank, thank you, Jonathan. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's a very, very, very interesting presentation. And so, um, right, I'm, you know, these re refutations are always difficult because, um, uh, you know, you, you hear this thing and you've got to kind of respond and it's not quite clear how best to do it. One point I will emphasize uh, that I assume Jonathan will get to later is that he did not uh, say anything, of course, because he had a prepared remark, but he, he talked about the early text and the later text, but he didn't point out that that later text is not found in any of our early manuscripts. It's interesting that he did mention uh, and spent a lot of time on Tertullian and Irenaeus and Eusebius um, and Ignatius, none of them, they, they themselves quote, the, the people that he wants to use to show that the later text is more authentic, none of them attests that text. Uh, okay, <laughs> that seems to me rather significant. Um, let's start where he started, uh, with Homer. I'm a, I'm a little bit surprised uh, that that Jonathan started with Homer. Um, as you know, uh, as you know, Jonathan, I mean, most people probably don't know this, but I mean, Homeric textual criticism is very complicated. Um, uh, I don't know a single classicist. Um, I know a lot of classicists uh, and uh, a lot of Homeric scholars, um, including my brother, for example, who's a Homeric scholar. Um, I don't know any classicist who would, who would say that a manuscript from the 15th century of Homer would be preferred in general to a manuscript that was discovered that was made 300 years after Homer. If you had a fifth century complete manuscript of the Iliad and the Odyssey, classicists would go nuts and they wouldn't go nuts because they would be saying, oh, well, this one isn't as accurate as the one done a thousand years later. No, they'd say, oh my God, finally we have something early. Um, you know, you talk about the standardization of the Homeric text. The reason it had to be standardized is because nobody knew what the text said in places. And I will point out that textual scholars still disagree on the Homeric text. I would also like to point out that these scholars you're talking about in second and third century Alexandria loved making emendations to the text. In other words, they thought that they were going to change the text from every manuscript they knew. And I wanna know if that's the process that you prefer with the New Testament, to admit that none of the manuscripts has the correct reading in it, because that's what emendation, uh, emendation is all about. I was a little bit confused also that you want to claim that the New Testament text, if it were standardized, had to be standardized like the Homeric text. It seems to me that one example of something does not set a pattern. So I'd like to know what your evidence is that this is how a text is always standardized. Let me give you two examples. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a modern example because, you know, not everybody's into textual criticism like you and me, Jonathan. So let me give you a modern <laughs> example. When I was in high school, we had to read uh, Great Expectations by Dickens. And uh, I was the only kid in my class who liked it. Sophomore in high school, I thought Great Expectations was fantastic. It had a really nice heartwarming ending where the hero of the story, Pip, and the girl, Esther, end up together. And, oh, this is glorious. A few years later, I read another copy of it in which it didn't work that way. It was a very sad ending. Esther got married to someone else and Pip was single. Ah, oh, that can't be right. Well, as it turns out, the version that you will find in almost every copy of Great Expectations is the happy ending. And it's not the original ending. 
Well, how did it become standardized? I can tell you this, there was not some committee in Alexandria who standardized it. The fact that something becomes standardized doesn't mean that it's the earliest form of the text. And let me show this with early Christianity. So uh, you're saying fourth century. Let's, let's stick to the fourth century for a second and think about other textual phenomena from the fourth, fourth Christian century. You mentioned Ignatius. Today, scholars are convinced that what's called the middle recension of Ignatius, which consists of seven letters, uh, was the one that Ignatius wrote. In the fourth century, there was a, uh, a forger uh, who changed these writings of Ignatius, who altered them significantly, and added six other letters so that uh, there are now 13 letters and the original seven are expanded significantly. This was not the original form of the text. This form of the text was created 200 years or more. It's probably created around the year 380. Ignatius is writing around the year 110. So about 270 years later, throughout the Middle Ages, it was the forged edition of Ignatius that everybody knew. Nobody knew the original version. Um, you can so, show this about a lot of things in the fourth century, for example, the correspondence between Paul and Seneca was invented in the fourth century. People who knew Paul after that knew it, knew the writings of Paul, including the writings of Paul and Seneca. Well, it was created in the fourth century. Why don't they have the original Paul? Because things get standardized. Christianity spreads, it becomes popular, and people get used to the way things are being said in this book or that book, this manuscript or that manuscript. When you wanted to say that in the fourth century um, that, that Christianity became declared legal uh, in 313 at the uh, in the Edict of Milan, that's completely right. Uh, and you, but you say we don't know what the official text was that was read at, until Milan, but we do have manuscripts. We have manuscripts from the second century. We have manuscripts from the third century uh, that are none of them like the later Byzantine text. I wasn't quite sure what your point was about Ignatius and Chrysostom. Um, so Chrysostom is a late fourth century church father, and you said his text would have been exactly like that of Ignatius. That's problematic on all sorts of grounds. Um, so Ignatius, as I was saying, was living about 270 years earlier. Ignatius does not indicate that he has any of our books of the New Testament. He does quote sayings of Jesus, but the sayings of Jesus do not appear to be like any, certainly none of our later Byzantine manuscripts, which makes me wonder, have you actually taken the quotations of the Gospels in Ignatius and compared them word for word with the quotations of those same Gospels in Chrysostom in order to show that they have the same text. <laughs> I, I have studied the quotations of both, and they are not at all alike. <laughs> so I don't understand what you mean by saying that Chrysostom's text of it would be exactly the same uh, as Ignatius. You mentioned some, several of the versions, and you point out the Peshitta. Well, it makes sense to make out, point out the Peshitta because that would be more, more like the kinds of the later text that you like. You didn't point out that the Peshitta was a later version of the Syriac, done in the 5th century. We have earlier Syriac manuscripts, the old Syriac, that don't have that form of text. Well, why is that? <laughs> and um, uh, right, uh, the Latin, the same thing. You talk about Jerome. You didn't mention why it was that, uh, that Jerome was asked by Pope Damasus to, uh, to standardize the Latin text. is because there were so many different forms of the Latin text that Jerome had to come up a way of standardizing them. But Jerome, Jerome, you know, extensively talks about the textual variance in earlier manuscripts. There wasn't a set text that he that he had uh, that he had established. He 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 made a text of some kind, although we don't really know what Jerome's copying practices were. But the more important point is that textual scholars have known for a very long time that there are old Latin manuscripts. We still have a number of them, and they're not like Jerome's text. They are older. So my question is, 
why are the older manuscripts consistently not consistent with the form of text you're saying is the original, the Byzantine text? Why are the older versions not consistent with it? And why do none of the early church fathers have it? Uh, I, uh, I don't see really, I mean, look, I... I don't have, I personally do not have a horse in this race. I don't, I don't. I mean, I really don't. Uh, I don't care if the story of the woman taking adultery is authentic or not. I mean, I, it just isn't something important to me personally. But really, I mean, uh, it seems like uh, you would need some evidence that this is early. And I don't see the evidence. Well, thank you very much for that, Bart. And uh, with that, he said, uh, Bart has just uh, finished five seconds earlier. Uh, then, uh, yes. so you kind of made up, <laughs> you made up time with that one. Now, no pressure on you, Jonathan, uh, because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going well, to try anyway, to earlier, so I do apologize for that. Well, no, let me get my, uh, clock thing. Cause, uh, I want to see if I can come in at, uh, under five minutes as well, <laughs> well <laughs> or under uh, five seconds as well. Under five seconds, yeah. With that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, guys, we're going to go to Jonathan for his uh, rebuttal. And, uh, yep, the time starts whenever you're ready. Okay. And, and once again, these are great questions from Dr. Ehrman. And we, we do have to explain where we're coming from because uh, Dr. Ehrman has made a, a lot of good points. Uh, we do have to address the earlier text forms, uh, not only in the uh, uh, Greek text, but as he noted with the Aramaic uh, text as well, uh, there are some earlier forms of the text that do, does exhibit something differently. Uh, so we, we do have to explain that. So uh, what I want to kind of talk about during this rebuttal is our evidence. Uh, so if you think about it from a trial standpoint, there's, there's two types of evidence presented to a court. There's testimonial uh, and there's exhibits. Now, testimonials are what a witness says, while exhibits refer to physical objects to prove some point. But what we see in trials is before an exhibit can be offered as evidence, you must prove it's authentic by laying the foundation. In other words, we have to demonstrate that we have sufficient knowledge to prove that the exhibit is authentic. So uh, let's go through some of the evidence and let's go into some of these earlier texts. So uh, right now, if you think about these earlier texts, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, P60, Six, P75, we look at these earlier text forms. Now, we don't have a witness like Jerome that can testify of knowledge of these texts. So, so we don't have that type of information. So typically what we look for is proviance. And proviance is a legal term that really enables historians to determine an object's authenticity by providing origin and chain of ownership. Now, uh, Dr. Tomry Wasserman and Jennifer Nunz, in their recently published title, To Cast the First Stone, um, the, they tell us that the origins of both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus remain frustratingly elusive, despite generations of scholarly debate seeking to clarify and resolve the problem. Therefore, no provenance can be established for these documents. Now, the only point to be made from these documents is we've identified a textual tradition, but we cannot determine which group this tradition belonged to. Uh, the point to be proven was that this textual tradition belonged to the official Greek churches. And in the case of uh, the, the Sinai and the Curitan, uh, the, um, these belong to the Aramaic churches, which we cannot do. Uh, in addition, th the other working presumption is that these documents are the best representatives of the earlier uh, generations. Uh, however, this idea is countered in uh, Gerard Mink's essay titled, Contamination, Coherence, and Coincidence in Textual Transmission. In his essay, Mink states, nearly all manuscripts from the first millennium are lost. What we have from the earliest phases of transmission is not likely to be representative of the text in those times. Elsewhere, Mink notes that the large number of papyrus and parchment fragments can be misleading, thus further calling into the question these assumptions. 
Finally, when we compare Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, both of which are estimated to be products of the fourth century, against Jerome's Vulgate, who did say he did go to the early Greek uh, texts. He was a student of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Gregory. Uh, as Dr. Tommy Wasserman had pointed out, he had met with uh, Didymus. So he has knowledge of these epicenters of Christianity. And the text form exhibited at Antioch uh, are different than the text forms we see here. So the question is, why would it we uh, side or give more weight to the documents that we do have uh, provenance of? We understand that there's probably political considerations to be made uh, for um, the, the texts at Antioch, but why wouldn't we give more weight to those texts? Now, doc, Dr. Aaron brings up a really good point because we do got to discuss the writings of the ancient fathers. Now, um, I, I do want to bring up real quickly Miller's study, where he did compose uh, over 86,000 quotations that Bergen had put together. He did do a study on those writings uh, from the Ming texts of the fathers and came out that the Byzantium text did exist at a margin of almost three to two. So uh, we do have the Miller study. Uh, that did do a study on there and came out that the Byzantium text form did exist. But I, I do want to spend a little time on the fathers uh, because this is important because they do indicate uh, the earlier text form. And when Dr. Ehrman talks about uh, Basil, uh, and we see this in a lot of fathers, they do quote it. Now, what I want to talk about is the black swan for this assumption is Neville Bertzel's 1956 study of the gospel texts in Photis. Because, and to provide context, Photis was the patriarch of Constantinople in the ninth century, twice. So it's natural to assume he had access to the official texts of Constantinople. Um, as a synod for the 1904 Greek patriarchal edition notated in his preface, the official texts in public use from the church of Constantinople from the ninth century through the 16th century was representative of the Syrian Byzantium text form based on the manuscript and lectionary data. Now, if uh, the assumptions are correct, Neville Burchell should have reported that the text in Photos' gospel quotations were predominantly Byzantium nature. Instead, Burchell stated that the opposite, that the most salient features of Photos' Markan citations are not Byzantium, but have affinities with earlier texts. Uh, Burchell also draws a similar conclusion in Photis's, uh quotation. He concludes his study by reporting that Photis's quotations are more closely aligned with the pre-Caesarean text. Now, we, we see the same results in Dr. Vorbis's examination, uh, biblical quotations of the famous bishop of the Syrian church, uh, Rabola of Edessa. So, uh, Dr. Vorbis was mainly concerned with Rabola's Syriac version of Cyro of Alexandria's uh, De Rectifida, a work containing some 40 quotations of the gospel alone. But Dr. Vorbis concluded in his investigation that the text that Rabola uh, was using wasn't the Peshitta, but the so-called old Syriac form of the text. Now, what these st studies clearly show is that the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Bishop of Edessa had access to private texts, which didn't represent the official texts of the churches, thus explaining why we find these differences in their writing. This is why Irenaeus and Tertullian specified that the official writings are found in the churches and didn't appeal to their own writings because we don't all start off as bishops and uh, you know members of the church. Uh, you know, we have to use what we have available and we can't go to Barnes and Noble back in that day. So um, lastly, I, I do want to talk about uh, another important theory, uh, Kenyon Watchell's hypothesis. Now, uh, their theory of this process that occurred, because uh, Dr. Ehrman, uh, you know, brought up about why I refer to the Homeric text. Now, there, there was a state of confusion. We had a theoretical mechanism in Pisistratus that can orchestrate it. But what this hypothesis is saying is, we don't have any theoretical mechanism, uh, even though Hort and Burkett 
actually propose one, but this is attributed to a tendency of scribes uh, to combine, uh, in the case of divergent readings, they're gonna uh, combine them into the text. So th this assumption is based on this principle that uh, scribes were more likely to omit uh, or add more than they were omit. But when we look at the actual studies that Eldon J. Epp has presented in his essay titled Traditional Canons of the New Testament Textual Criticism, Royce uh, published his 1080 page volume assessing scribal habits in the early New Testament papyri. And in looking at P45, 46, 66, 72, and 75, he concluded the scribes of those six papyri omit more often than they add. Uh, Royce actually was pleased to report that other studies, previous and recent, supported that conclusion. Notably, Peter Head, who stated, once again, it seems that the evidence suggests that most early scribes are more likely to omit than to add material. Juan Hernandez came to the same conclusion. Uh, Dirk Junkin published his scribal habits of Codex Sinaiticus and agreed that the scribal tendency to omit rather to add um, that was found by Royce was the same. And last but uh, not least, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, we have a scribe and its teacher speaking to us from the grave to weigh in on this assumption. In Vaticanus, uh, we do find the following notation, which Bruce Metzger translated as fool and knave can't you leave the old reading alone and not alter it? This statement appears to falsify this so-called tendency to add, which explains the creation or standardization of the Byzantium text form. And All I will right. All right. Did I go under <laughs> five seconds? You actually crossed 35 seconds. So guess oh. what? Both you and Bart are on level terms um, again. So um, yeah. So, yeah, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope that you've enjoyed both the opening statements and the rebuttal period. Uh, I do sense a lot of questions are coming in, especially uh, from uh, your channel, James. So uh, do keep the questions coming as we approach the cross-examination session. Uh, we are going to have 10 minutes of the first part of the cross-examination. Dr. Bart, um, Dr. Bart would go first in cross-examining uh, John, Jonathan and... Uh, he would have 10 minutes to do so. Your time starts, uh, but whenever you're ready. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I wasn't quite quite I wasn't quite sure why you're mentioning this business about how scribes are more likely to um, um, change either to add or to subtract. And I, I didn't understand what what how that affected your argument. Well, so to explain the creation, so do, uh, I know if you could do it very quickly because I've got a lot. I do have a lot of questions. Okay, uh, real quickly, uh, uh, the basis for the standardization, as proposed by Kenyon and Watchell, is that uh, the standardization was a result of scribal habits uh, combining uh, diverse readings, which brought about the uniformity of the Byzantine. Oh, text. I see. Yeah, that's that's. I don't think anybody has that view anymore. So, um, so, I, so, uh, okay. Um, you mentioned a number of. Uh, you, you've mentioned a number of scholars. Just now, you mentioned Kenyon. Uh, you've mentioned uh, Royce, uh, Peter Head, uh, Eldon App, Hernandez, uh, Parker, Mink, Michael Holmes, Klaus Vachtel. Uh, Barbara and Kurt Allad, et cetera, Metzger. Does any of them agree with you about the Byzantine text? No, they, they all disagree with me on that position. Yeah, yeah they do. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, it's fairly striking. And of course, it's not evidence, right? It, it's not evidence that they're, you know, they might all be wrong, but these are among the world scholars, <laughs> leading scholars in this, who, who've looked at all the evidence. So it's, it's just at least worth pointing out. Um, <laughs> You started out by uh, talking about how the origins of our early manuscript are elusive. In other words, we don't have the provenance. Um, and I think by that you mean, we don't know where Codex Sinaiticus was actually produced or Codex Vaticanus or P75 or P6. We don't know like where the scribe was who made that. that that's, is that what you mean by provenance? Yes, Dr. Irvin. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you aren't disagreeing on the dates of these things. 
No, I I, I accept the, uh, the the estimated dates of the fourth century, so uh, right yeah. around three twenty five. Uh, yeah, yeah well, I, P seventy five and P sixty six earlier. But the thing about them is that all of these don't have the Byzantine text, but they're earlier. Yes, um, but does that? Uh, well, I won't go into the. <laughs> I'll wait till my turn on the questions. But okay, okay, right. okay, okay, they are yeah, earlier. Yeah. So when you say that we don't know the provenance, I, I just wanted to explore that a little bit because um, it's true. I mean, we don't know. We don't know where these things were actually produced, but we do have a pretty good idea of when they were produced. Um, the way people so, sometimes establish provenance for manuscripts like these, I'll, I'll just stick to the ones you said, uh, uh, Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, P75 and P60, because they're, they're generally uh, generally considered four of our very best manuscripts. They absolutely do not have the Byzantine text. Um, and um, But the, the way that people have an idea of where the text was in certain times or places is by uh, patristic evidence, by which I mean that um, um, they, they compare these manuscripts with church fathers who can be located. So a church father lives in, you know, in Antioch, or a church father lives in Rome, or a church father lives in Alexandria, Egypt. And you can, you can compare their uh, quotations of the New Testament. You take their quotations, and um, you can... Uh, uh, you you can compare them with the manuscripts. So that, for example, my my PhD dissertation, I worked on Didymus the Blind. <laughs> it's not not exactly asshole term name, but you, you would know him. And he and he and he was a fourth century. As you mentioned, you mentioned him that he that Jerome studied with him. Uh, he lived in Alexandria, um, and that's where he lived. That's where he worked. That's where he wrote. I mean, he didn't write. He dictated because he was blind. He, he, he but he was, had a phenomenal memory, and he memorized the Bible. And he and so. Um, when, when you compare his quotations, uh, so he's living in the fourth century, uh, somewhat before Chrysostom, uh, when, and he's living in Alexandria. When you compare his quotations, they line up by far the most closely with Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, P75, and P66. They don't line up with the Byzantine text. Um, so how would you explain that? Well, I, I, I think there's a couple of things uh, to, to kind of discuss on that matter. Um, and, and once again, this is circumstantial. Uh, first, um, the knowledge base that Jerome had in meeting with uh, uh, Didymus, and he did translate one of his works. So he was, he was very aware of uh, Didymus's work. But when we look at Jerome's uh, Vulgate, we notice some of the biggest readings that are not in Sinaiticus and Vaticanus are not in there. And I would, I would almost presume to think that uh, if they're going to, if, if they had conversations or they met, you know, what would they be talking about other than, hey, I'm working on this big project. So um, the, the other part of that thing is what the studies of Bertzel show with the Patriarch of Constantinople Fotis and Dr. Vorbis's study of Rabula, uh, the Bishop of Edessa, is that they're using another text form, though we would in Constantinople, and, and you can let me know if you disagree with this or not, but uh, the text form being read in the official church of Constantinople is the Byzantium text. So what yeah, accounts- see, that's what I, didn't, I really didn't understand that argument of yours because you were arguing that Photius didn't have it. And so it needs the patriarch of Constantinople. So, so, I mean, it seemed like, a, it seemed like I was more arguing on my side than your, but okay. So I want, I want, I don't have much time. So I want to ask something else. You talk about Jerome and of course, yeah. Jerome was very much involved with the debates over um, origin. Now, origin, I think you would agree. Origin was probably the greatest uh, biblical scholar uh, in the uh, first three centuries. Um, um, at least he's generally seen, seen that way. <laughs> Could you tell us something about Origen's text of the New Testament? He, 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 he looked into manuscripts, just like Jerome did, and he talks about the oldest manuscript. So can you tell us what uh, Origen's form of the text was? Well, I, and, and once again, Origen does uh, quote heavily, and I think Reisbach uh, indicated this as well. He leans with that older form of the text. Now, uh, the, the problem I have with Origen, and once again, he has done some great works uh, against Celsius. He's done some good pieces, but 
we do have to take in consideration his methodology uh, that he was actually thrown out of Alexandria uh, by his bishop. Uh, not because was, of his biblical interpretation or not because of his text criticism. Well, I don't know, uh, I don't well, know if you I don't know if you know this book. So uh, I wrote a book on origins text of the New Testament with uh, Gordon Fee and Mike Holmes, whom, both of whom you mentioned. Uh, we collected every quotation of origin of the Gospel of John. This book is uh, it's it's uh, about 500 pages long, and we cited every reference of origins quotations of John. So origin is writing say early third century. He dies mm -hmm. in the 250s, uh, and he's in Alexandria. And by far, his closest associations are with Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, P75, and P66. Not He does has almost no connections with the Byzantine text. So, I mean, you know, you did mention, um, you did mention the study by Miller. Um, so, uh, do you remember when that study was done? Yeah, no, that, that was done in uh, the late 1800s. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, based on Bergen's work, which was compiled in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, do, you, do you know what most people have pointed out is the problem with these studies done at the end of the 19th on the Church Fathers? I mean, I, I'm happy they're to summarize the, them. That they're using the Ming texts? Um, so which, so it's not just that they're using Minya, it's that, that, that the... Um, in the 20th and 21st century, scholars have come up with editions of the church fathers that look at, uh, that try to establish what the fathers actually wrote. And in almost every instance that has been documented, just almost every instance, it's been shown that these 19th century editions of the church fathers included quotations of the, uh, of the New Testament that were not were not actually what the church fathers quoted. They were changed by later scribes into conformity with the Byzantine text. And so today, textual scholars who study the patristic text, I don't know anybody who thinks that any of the early church fathers had the Byzantine text, and nobody agrees with Miller's views on this. And you can just go down the list of all the experts in patristic evidence. I mean, uh, you know, I wrote my dissertation on it, but Gordon Fee, Michael Holmes, who you mentioned, Rod Mullen, James Brooks, uh, Jean-Francois Rossin, John Brogan, I mean, all these studied early church, and none of them has the Byzantine text. Why, why would that be? Well, uh, you, you know, once again, I, I probably support uh, uh, um, Miller on there, but does, you know, uh, I was under a view that the papyri that came out, while uh, it's, you know, representing of the earlier form, it I does know. have some uh, quotations of the Byzantine uh, manuscripts. And I think P66 doesn't show that uh, P66 that the scribe was actually uh, taking that text and actually arranging it to the form of, uh, so he was changing it from Byzantium no. to Alexandrian, which would show no. the existence. No, 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 not true. All right, we're going to have to stop there, but uh, thank you very much for that first cross examination. Now we're going to flip the uh, the, the, the cross-examiner, <laughs> John, uh, Jonathan, is going to have the opportunity to cross-examine, but uh, you would have 10 minutes as well, John. Time starts at your first word. Okay. Um, so, Dr. Armand, I guess, how do we reconcile Gerald Mink's statement that what we have from the early phases of transmission is not likely to be representative of the text in those times? with the assumption that the earlier extant forms of the text um, are the best representatives. Uh, so Gerhard Mink is a, um, uh, is a very uh, important scholar who worked at the Institute for Textual, uh, New Testament Textual Research in Münster, Germany. Um, and he, um, he uh, made a number of very important advances uh, in our field. One thing that he uh, absolutely um, agreed on is that the Byzantine text is completely secondary, that it's not reliable, and that we, uh, we cannot base our translations or our Greek editions of the New Testament on the Byzantine text. That's not to say that we understand everything about the textual history of the early text. We don't ever understand everything about it because we don't have sufficient evidence. That's why the patristic evidence is so important. Um, 
I think I think some text critics maybe don't take the patristic evidence uh, as seriously as maybe they could, because with the patristic evidence, you are able to locate when and where a text was a certain form. Uh, and so, um, but even so, it's very hard to connect the dots among the, because the early manuscripts are few and far between, and so you can't establish provenance, but you also can't establish clear connections among them. Unlike the later text, the Byzantine text, there are so many of these things, and they're so similar that it's it's easier in, in many ways to draw lines between them. And so, so um, the Byzantine text, you're pretty sure it's representative of X, Y, or Z. The, the early text, you don't you don't know is P sixty six like this? It's like that. I mean, it's, we don't have enough evidence. So that I think that's what he means. But he absolutely was not arguing that that means that the Byzantine text is the is something close to the original because he he spent his most of his career <laughs> thinking showing you know. Actually, it's not. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. Definitely, he wouldn't agree <laughs> with the Byzantium text. Um, let, let's talk a, take a look at Birdsell's statement. And, and, it, and it goes back to this point. Uh, so Birdsell, in referring to his own study and the works of Lake, Lagrange, Colwell, and Streeter, stated, it's evident all presuppositions concerning the Byzantium text or text except its inferiority to other types, must be doubted and investigated de novo. Now, yes, if the yes. premises have been falsified, should oh, not no, 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 no. Well, uh, so go ahead. Go he, ahead. So he, he's not falsifying the premise that the Byzantine text is late. No. So, but if he says all his presuppositions concerning the Byzantium text, must be okay, doubted. Well, well, let, we'll let John finish the question. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, no, no. It's okay. Uh, yeah. And, and let me know if I need to clarify, Dr. Urban. But so if he says we have all these presuppositions concerning the Byzantium text, and now they must be doubted and investigated, shouldn't Bertzel have said, hey, the presuppositions are presuppositions need to be uh, reinvestigated? Uh, they're doubted. Isn't this the turning point to say, hey, let me, uh, while I, I have preconceived notions and I take this position that the Syrian Byzantium text form is secondary, but don't here we follow the facts and say, let's reconsider the status of the Byzantium text form? Um, yes. Um, could you, I'm sorry to, to have interrupted you. Could you, could, oh, you remind no. me what, could you remind me what year that was written? Uh, 1956. Uh, it was Birdsell's study of yeah. the text of Fotis. So, right, exactly. So, you know, I mean, it's that was 60 years ago. Um, there's been a lot of study in the Byzantine text since then. Um, in the middle, middle of the uh, 20th century, people had certain ideas about how the Byzantine text came about. And in fact, they had ideas about how all of these various textual forms came about. Uh, one of the popular views was that all of these textual forms came from a single, like, edition that somebody made, like somebody made a single edition that became the Alexandrian text and a single edition that became the Western text and this single edition that became the Byzantine text. And nobody, nobody who is seriously working in the field very much doubted that the Byzantine text was later. They were just trying to figure out how did it, how did it happen? And what I think, what uh, I, you know, I haven't, I'll tell you, I haven't read Birdsall's article on Photius in probably 30 years, so I am not, <laughs> but, but I will say, uh, Birdsall did not, Birdsall absolutely knew that the Byzantine text was later, and he had no doubts about that, as, as you pointed out in your quotation of him, but he did say that, look, if you've got later church fathers, like in, in, the, in the ninth century, if you've got a church father who's quoting a form of the text that is, that is an earlier form, that shows that uh, we need to figure out how that is. What, why would a ninth century father know an earlier form? Uh, that's not to deny it's the earlier form. It is the earlier form. So he's, so, but we have to figure out, you know, and so that's why, for example, Klaus Wachtel wrote his, uh, whom you mentioned, wrote his impressive uh, work on the, uh, that basically deals with the history of the Byzantine text um, and argues that it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't come in suddenly. It was a gradual development. Um, and um, 
he shows it pretty convincingly. So if, if you want to argue that the late text, say, of the you know, 12th century is closer to the original, you really need to take on Klaus Wachtel's argument because uh, he, he pretty well shows that, that, it was, you know, that, it, that it wasn't a sudden thing. It didn't like show up in the year 400 or something. Yeah. Now, so just to touch on Klaus Wachtel's argument, and, and this may make a little sense why I, I went to the Homeric text. Now, um, and, and once again, it's a great study. I, I've always been fond of the Homeric text, uh, just kind of growing up and reading it. But now w- what we can see from history, and this is all the way back from the sixth century, is that the process to take it from the sixth century down to the second and then even after, it, it went through a developmental process, kind of similar to what uh, Watchell kind of explained for the uh, um, for the Byzantium text, starting in the third or fourth, and then we have the Heartland, and then down uh, at the last stage in the ninth going forward. So the question, uh, and this is a problem I have, and once again, I could be wrong, is what we see for the Homeric text, this process, the names, the dates, the attestation, we, we don't see with uh, Byzantium uh, text form like that. So we don't see names. We don't see an editorization process. Uh, yes, as you mentioned, the Library of Alexandria, they had critical editors, but we know who they were. We know what they were doing um, all the way back to the second century BC. But something that happened starting sometime in the third all the way to the 1200s, uh, we don't see a, a visible editorization process that you would think would be consistent with what we saw with the Homeric text. Well, that's no. You're right about that. Home, home, the Homeric text. The Alexandrian scholars tried to standardize the Homeric text. Uh, that is right. Um, the Byzantine text did not follow that process. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that there wasn't a standardization. It means they did it in a different way. And you know, if I were cross-examining you right now, which uh, I dearly wish I were, because if I were, I would ask you if you if you know of any Homeric scholar that thinks that a 13th century text is better than a text written a thousand years earlier, a manuscript written a thousand years earlier, because I can't think of one. The other thing I can't think of, the other one I can't think of is any other classical text besides Homer that you can say that about. Well, on that thought, and you are right about that, Dr. I mean, I'm not going to... Uh, so I don't think Homer is the example for everything for standardization because it's not um, it, it's a it, it's a weird te- I mean home I mean people need to understand Homer was big um, I mean I mean you can't understand ancient ancient writings period after Homer without understanding Homer I mean because everybody read Homer it was it wasn't like the Bi- like our Bible but it was like it was well and so they wanted to standardize this text because it was so well known. And um, so they did that, but you don't, you don't find people doing that with Plato or with Juvenal or with Marshall or with like you know, whoever Cicero, whoever. They just say this. So this was a one-off, and so it can't be the standard for how it must have happened with the Bible. One one last question on uh, text. So so when we look at the uh, the text of the Greek Orthodox or the Syrian Byzantium text form. So we do see that majority of the manuscripts are late and they represent this uh, text form. Now, the, the Jewish church, when we look at the Jewish church, now the oldest text from the official church, uh, the official synagogues, the Masoretic. Now, the earliest or text that we have is the, the ninth and 10th centuries. Um, so we see a pattern that the survivability of these texts from the Jewish churches, they're right around the same time of what we have for the Greeks. Well, um, that's, that's right. And of course, there are debates in the, in among Hebrew textual scholars, whether Codex Leningradensis, which is the main one that our Hebrew Bibles are based on, is representative of, uh, of the text, say, a thousand years earlier. For example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found a copy of uh, Jeremiah that is different by a length of 15% from Codex Leningradensis. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, standardization guys, uh, doesn't mean superiority. Yeah. 
Sorry. Unfortunately, guys, I would hate to cut you off in the middle of such an interesting point, but uh, we're, sticking, we're sticking strictly to time. And just in case for those of you at home are wondering, uh, we do give our speakers an additional 30 seconds after we call time uh, just to finish their thoughts, because this is, again, as I mentioned at the start, it's a substantive debate. So with that, thank you both, gentlemen, for that wonderful first round of cross-examination. And I hope all of you watching have really enjoyed that. This has been a cordial exchange. Uh, we have one more round uh, of the same thing. <laughs> We're going to go back. I know Dr. Uh, Abad has been really, really interested to, uh, to cross-examine Jonathan. You're going to have another <laughs> chance to do that again uh, 10 minutes this time. Uh, the time starts when you start speaking. Uh, right. So I'm kind of running out of questions. So, um, right. So, um, you know, uh, do you like the Patriots this year? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a Giants fan. I grew up in New York, but oh we're not. Uh, I'm, so, so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry too, actually. We need to get Eli out of there. So, uh, um, okay. Could you, could you just say something about why you imagine, um, uh, there's such a consensus among, uh, modern scholars uh, about the Byzantine text. I mean, the, um, the, you know, as I pointed out, every, every scholar you've mentioned from the 20th century um, thinks that the Byzantine text uh, is late. And these are, these, are not, these are not scholars who are all of one uh, persuasion. Uh, some of the scholars, you, I mean, I don't know everybody's persuasion, but some of them you've mentioned uh, were, uh, were Anglican, uh, some were Baptist, some were agnostic, um, some uh, are uh, some are Catholic. I'm just looking at my list here. Some are nothing. <laughs> I mean, uh, so it's not like you know, uh, you know, Bible believing Christians have, scholars have one view, and uh, you know, liberal scholars have another view, and atheists have some other view. It's like all of these scholars you've mentioned have the same view, and it's that. And so, could you just say why? Again, I'm not saying that that's evidence that they're right, but could you just say what? Why you imagine they they they're all wrong? Well, and, uh, and it is a good point, and I think it needs explaining. I, I, I think, you know, for the first part, we can trace the history of this particular school of thought. Uh, you know, we, we see it coming out of Greisbach and Burst noticing that in the writings of origin, we see an earlier form of the text. Um, you know, we see the work of Lachman, we see the work of Trigelis, and then we see you know, Hort, who, you know, as an Anglican, I have tremendous respect for. Um, now, Hort, you know, looked at the problem and he understood that, well, uh, to create this text or to explain the creation, we need this. Um, so what we see over the last part of the 18th century going in is we start to see a shift in the worldview. Um, obviously we had the enlightenment coming in uh, so this change your worldview, um, as you know, postmodernism is really big. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what we've seen with the influence of Kant coming in, this changing rationale uh, into the German schools. And out are, of the are you German saying that postmodernism was big in the 19th century? Well, no, I'm saying it, it's starting to come in. And postmodernism? Mm hmm. At, um, you know, some of the stuff that we see is, you know, the kind of, you know, changing views, especially with Kant, you know, uh, a lot of scholars kind of indicate that Kant was the, uh, you know, set the path for postmodernism. Um, Stephen Hicks, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Dr. Stephen Hicks, but he does uh, several videos where he traces postmodernism back to uh, back to Kant. I, they could, I, I don't know any continental philosopher who would say Kant was postmodernist. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. It's like, okay, yeah, okay, all right. But anyway, forget postmodernism because that, yeah. that's a whole, but I mean, postmodernism is not but, the 19th century phenomenon. Okay, but, but go ahead, but, but, but explain, explain to me why all these modern scholars, because they're not postmodernist. Most, trust me, most text critics are not postmodernist. So what, but, so why, okay, so explain to me, why, why are they all wrong? Well, you know, they, they wouldn't be uh, wrong if they were able to substantiate the history. Uh, 
you know, and this is my problem with the school. I, I would say it's, it's right too. Like if Hort was able to show in the very beginning that, uh, um, you know, Luke and of Antioch did compile the text that gave us a theoretical mechanism, a way to get it into the church. So we have that, um, Burkett, you know, was that, the, was that Hort's view? Huh? Yeah, Hort's view was that uh, what explained the uh, Byzantium text is Luke and of Antioch conflated the text, introduced it into uh, Antioch, and because of the popularity of Chrysostom, that text you, became um, the, the general witness throughout okay. the Greek speaking world. It might, it might be helpful if you would explain to people. I mean, Westcott and Hort were very important. Their yes. text in 1881 pretty much overthrew the, the form of text that you're, you're preferring. Um, could you explain what his argument was and why, why you don't, don't find it convincing? Well, because he, well, first and foremost is, you know, he, he, put, the, he put together a theoretical mechanism to explain because we would naturally think that the churches, they had a system that Irenaeus and Tertullian identify to help secure the chain of custody for the text, to preserve the evidence up through uh, the centuries leading up to the fourth century. So they had a polity in place that uh, Hort understood that there was this polity in place. They had this form of government to secure the chain of custody. So what we see coming up, we would naturally think is the faithful uh, representation. But Hort said, well, because he started noticing these earlier text forms uh, that the, the explanation for the Byzantium text was this conflation of these earlier texts that gave rise to the text. And at Chrysostom, where he attacked, he basically said that Chrysostom was so popular, he had great influence throughout the Greek Orthodox world. He went to Constantinople, and then this form of the text became popularized in the preachings of Chrysostom that it, it kind of influenced and went into that course and this is what we see yeah, yeah. coming out. No, that, that's right. I mean, it, that's how that's how he kind of, basically kind of how he traced the history. But I'm just wondering, he had, I mean, he had a number. Uh, he had he cited evidence to to try and show by what he called it the Syrian text, the what we're calling the Byzantine text, and he had evidence to show why it is almost certainly an inferior form of the text. And I just I just wanted to know whether you had explanations for why you didn't think his. He has three main arguments, and I didn't know whether you, you had explanations for why. Uh, yeah, um, you, you know, I, I think with uh, Hort, and, and once again, I have tremendous respect for Hort, but it was founded, he understood that a theoretical mechanism was needed to explain it. And when that theoretical mechanism fell, I don't understand why the natural uh, assumption wouldn't be back that these are uh, the most faithful representatives of the text form that came through the church since there was a system of government that was set up to do so. So, so Jonathan, um, you, I mean, you realize that in, in lots of fields, there are hard and fast conclusions uh, for which people don't have explanations. In the sciences, this happens all the time. Uh, people realized that there was gravity <laughs> before <laughs> Newton. Um, and so, um, you know, Newton didn't invent gravity. Everybody knew that if you, if you drop uh, uh, something from your hand, it's going to fall to the earth. So the fact that, he didn't have, that they didn't have an explanation didn't mean that, so nobody would have said, yeah, actually gravity, maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe if you drop something, it's going to fly up to the sky. They said, no, of course it's going to drop it. We just don't know how it happened. So the evidence that Hort cited uh, and that people have cited since then is just so um, is so compelling to people, even people who don't have a vested interest. You know, people who'd really, I mean, it's not that they like they really care one way or the other. It's just they look at the evidence and say, ah. And so maybe instead of Hort, maybe you could just explain my the evidence that I keep harping on. Um, none of the manuscripts that we have say, let's just say before the uh, before the end of the fourth century, has the Byzantine text. None of them. Um, none of the church fathers before the end of the fourth century who quotes the New Testament has the Byzantine text. None of them. 
The oldest versions don't have it. So how is there such a consistent uh, display of evidence on one side when you're saying that all of that evidence is wrong? Well, and see, here's where I guess maybe the difference would come in. So if, like for the Peshitta, now if Westcourt, uh, as he originally conceded that the Peshitta was second century, which they he had originally put, now I get the Peshitta is a mixed text, but it, it is kind of part Byzantium. So you, you, you don't date it to the second century, do you? Well, Peshitta? I, well, so he, here's the thing about the Peshitta is when Burkett proposed the uh, Rubola uh, recension. Oh, uh, can I go ahead and just finish yeah, up sure. the answer second. to Dr. Herman? So, you know, the, the explanation that was first put forth to explain the existence of the Peshitta was F.C. Burkett's Rebola of Rathesa. He brought in uh, this text into the Aramaic churches. Um, but the, the problem with that was obviously Dr. Vorbis's study that showed that he's actually quoting the old, uh, so-called old Syriac. So we have to explain, how did he get into all those churches of different backgrounds? You have to. And yeah. can I finish well, up? I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish the sentence. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, we have to explain where does it come from, and we know the polity of those churches, we know where they came from. While we don't know the exact provenance of the Peshitta per se, we, don't, we do know the history of those churches, and they do go back to the beginning. And right. Eusebius's document does show, and I'll just be quiet, I apologize. <laughs> right. We're way across the time, but I totally get that. I mean, this, is, this has been such fun uh, hearing both sides. So again, once again, I do apologize uh, for cutting uh, in between, uh, didn't mean, just just sticking to the time. Uh, and with that, we'll pass the time over to uh, Jonathan for the final round of cross-examination for this debate. Uh, Jonathan, 10 minutes starts at your first word. Okay. Oh, let's see. Yeah, I wanna make sure I'm not running out of uh, questions either. Um, so let's talk about some of the early texts. So when we look at the, the history of biblical texts from the second, third, fourth century, now the fathers do tell us that other textual traditions existed. I, I think what can be uh, exemplified there is Marcion. Now he's the biggest case study of a biblical text representing a different textual tradition than what Irenaeus and Tertullian were saying in the churches. Now, given the understanding that other textual traditions existed and we can't uh, determine the provenance of these texts, uh, why aren't we taking that in consideration that these can be texts from other Christian uh, groups? Um, I mean, we had the Monetists, we have the Modalists, we have the Novationists. Uh, we know that there was uh, political, theological influences uh, in their views. Um, why wouldn't they also be representatives of these other textual traditions, but not the official text that we find in the church? Well, there wasn't an official text in the church. Um, and so, um, yeah, yeah, so th there was no official text in the church in, the, in these centuries, period. Um, and no, nobody thinks there was. Uh, Irenaeus's text isn't the same as Tertullian's text, and so uh, and it's not the same as Origen's text, and it's not the same. As, and so, you know, Gregory Nyssa's text, and so uh, there's not an official text. The fact that you've got different textual forms doesn't 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 show that any one of them is right or wrong. As you yourself said, Photius in the ninth century had a different textual form. But you wouldn't want somebody to say, well, Photius had a different textual form. Therefore, none of the textual forms in the ninth century were original. So the fact you've got different textual forms simply means there are different textual forms, and you have to figure out what the original text is. So this is the task. This is what textual critics do. Mm -hmm. they, they look at the various kinds of manuscripts and figure out what the original text is. Now, Marcion, I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure what your point about Marcion is. So Marcion, in case people don't know, Marcion was a, uh, a teacher who lived in the middle of the second century, um, who uh, ended up uh, moving to Rome 
And uh, he produced there a version of what he considered to be the New Testament. This is before everybody agreed on what the New Testament was. <laughs> and so, in fact, so some people think that Marcion was the first to construct a canon, like it actually, like this is the New Testament. It said, this is it. And his consisted of a form of the Gospel of Luke um, that apparently was somewhat truncated uh, and a form of 10 of Paul's letters. And he says, that's the Christian Bible. Uh, no Old Testament, <laughs> no other Gospels, just these things with Paul. And we don't know, actually. He, he definitely knew the Old Testament. We don't know whether he knew about Matthew, uh, Mark, and John. And we don't know if he knew of the letters or the book of Acts outside of, outside of Paul. Um, so he creates this edition. And according to Irenaeus and Tertullian, what he did was not only claim that this is the Bible, but he also edited these, uh, these books in order to uh, make them conform more closely or be more usable, at least, for his own theological views. Uh, and his view, theological views were that the God of the Old Testament was not the God of Jesus. He thought there were two gods and that the Old Testament God literally wasn't wasn't the Christian God. <laughs> the creator God is not not the God of Jesus. So it's a fairly radical view in Irenaeus's and Tertullian's view. And he he mo he molded or edited a New Testament in order to to help to help uh, promote his view. Um, scholars of Luke tend uh, or scholars of Paul almost never think that Marcion is giving us the some kind of original text, or that it's a, you know, that we, we don't have Mar we don't have Marcion's text. We don't have a manuscript. We don't have a single manuscript that has Marcion's text in it. And so it's not the kind of thing that scholars look at when they're trying to figure out what the original text is. What I will say is that it was nothing like the Byzantine text. <laughs> 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 and, and so when, when irony is, is, Tertullian quotes Marcion at length. Mar, Tertullian wrote a five volume work called Against Marcion. And he, he talks at length about his, uh, his views about Luke and Paul and his quotations of Luke, his, his text of Luke and Paul. And if you actually look at those quotations, uh, you can kind of get some sense of what Marcion's text looked like, and it did not look like the Byzantine text, and he's another second century church father. So once again, everyone you can look at, nobody has this thing. It, so it's got almost certainly has to be a later development. If it weren't a later development, surely somebody would have it. <laughs> some manuscript, some version, some church, some church father, somebody would have it. Nobody has it. And so that's... Yeah, and, and once again, I know we could go a lot on the second century. The point of Marcy was really just to showcase that other text forms did exist, that yes. Marcy was shorter. Um, but I, I do want to follow up on a different question. Uh, and, and as you're probably aware, uh, the 1904 uh, Greek patriarchal text that the, uh, uh, the Church of the Seven Ecumenical Councils, they came together. It does look like it was a response to Hort. Um, but in that case, when we look at the, the culture of the Greek Orthodox Church, whenever they came to resolve issues or do something in their normal practice, they would have a council, uh, which, you know, then leads me to uh, come, well, if there was some sort of editorialization or process going on, typically we would find them meeting together to talk about it. Now, we do see them doing that in 1904. And in their Greek preface to their edition, they, they do reject uh, the, uh, the, the unsouls, so the codexes, uh, that uh, here in the West, uh, there's a lot more value placed on it. And the official patriarchs of the Greek Orthodox Church chose to go with the text form that they believe is the earliest form that has been ecclesiastical uh, transmitted. So they did have great scholars there. What, why, and, and give me your view, why do you see that there was a difference in scholarship and the understanding on a text that does belong to the Greek Orthodox Church than the scholars here in the West? No, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, first thing I'll say is that, um, that, um, that a, a group of church leaders in 1904 probably the, the text that they agree with in 1904 is not necessarily indicative 
of the state of the text in the year uh, 204. Mm-hmm. It's 1700 years later, and they didn't have, you know, they didn't have any particular access to things earlier. Why did they prefer this text? I think it's a pretty easy reason. Um, Throughout the Byzantine church, uh, for many, many centuries, there was a form of the text that everybody was familiar with. It had the last 12 verses of Mark. It had the story of the woman taken in adultery. It had all sorts of passages that were familiar to people. And people just assumed that if it's the thing I'm familiar with, that must be what the Bible really is. Um, it's, it happens all, all over the place. Um, for example, uh, I know you, you and I both grew up in the uh, Episcopal Church, um, mm-hmm. Jonathan. And um, when I was uh, in my teen years, they came in with the new prayer book. The and it drove, or the... Every, drove everybody flipping crazy yes. because they changed the prayers. And they changed uh, I'm a 1928 like, guy, by the way. Of course you are. And, <laughs> and everybody I knew wanted to keep the old one. And if they if they if the committee had been formed of people in my church, the prayer book would not have been changed. It would have been 1928. So the fact you have a group of people who are familiar with something and they want to keep it the way they're used to, of course they do. I mean, uh, and you know, and so that's what happened in 1904. These are these are these are church leaders in the in the Orthodox Church who have grown up with a form of the text that they're parents and grandparents and great-grandparents had that they there's been in the church for centuries and they're saying look this is the text a comparable phenomenon of course is with the king james movement um where people you know they just they grew up on the king james and it's the bible i mean don't give me a new translation the new translation's wrong give me the bible and that's the king james it's not based on scholarship it's based on familiarity and that's that's just how it happened it happened in Greece. Of course, they're going to keep the. Of course, they're going to keep their the text they've had for centuries, and they're going to try and ward off these kind of crazy new new ideas that are coming in. Now, to follow up on that point that you made, now if there was an editorialization process going on in the Greek Orthodox Church between the third and ninth century, uh, it brings up why don't we see any commotion about any of these changes being introduced into I'm, the divine literature? Uh, because oh. there wasn't a, there wasn't an official editorial process. I I completely disagree with that. That's not that's okay. not what any of us is saying. If there were an editorial, we certainly would have heard about it. <laughs> but <laughs> it's it's not how it happened. Well, thank you very much for that, uh, both of you, John and uh, Bart, for that wonderful wonderful exchange that we've had. Uh, we have been given a treat, and with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to the final part of our formal debate, and that will be the closing statements, which is actually combined with a response statement. So typically what you would have in a debate is a response statement and a closing. We've decided to lump it together. Uh, So we'll have our our, our panelists be able to respond to whatever just taken place to summarize uh, the entire uh, debate that we've had so far and to close. So each of the participants will have 10 minutes each. We'll once again uh, begin with Bart. Uh, You have 10 minutes uh, anytime you're ready. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And Jonathan, this has been great. Very, very, very interesting indeed. Um, the, um, the text of the New Testament is a very complicated uh, field of study. Uh, it takes years of expertise uh, for somebody even to kind of dig in. And I hope a lot of you, I hope most of you haven't been kind of lost uh, down in the weeds because we kind of got down in the weeds a bit. And um, so let me let me just try and uh, as, as well as I can try and uh, simplify it uh, uh, to try and make sense of, of, of how I understand what happened in the in the transmission of the text of the New Testament. Um, so uh, somebody writes an original text, somebody writes the Gospel of Matthew and a scribe copies that copy. Uh, and then somebody copies the copy, and somebody copies the copy of the copy, and it goes on like that for, well, until until the invention of printing and beyond the invention of printing. All of the copies are made by hand. Different uh, different scribes copying this text change the text. 
Um, most of the time, they just change it by accident. I mean, scribes are humans. They're, they're not machines. And so scribes will be copying a text, say they're copying Matthew, and they'll be sleepy. <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be inattentive. They'll be bored. I mean, it's like it's not fun copying Matthew. Try it sometime. You'll see. And you'll make mistakes. But then when somebody copies that copy, um, they, uh, you know, they'll copy your mistakes and they'll, and then they'll make mistakes. And then the next person will copy that kind of, they'll make mistakes. And so it's, and so you end up with these thousands of manuscripts we have, and there are lots of mistakes in them. And the business of textual criticism, one of the, one of the main businesses of textual criticism is to figure out if we can get back to what the earliest copies look like. Um, can we get back to, um, to, can we possibly get back to what Matthew actually wrote? I mean, we hope so, because you can't interpret Matthew's words if you don't know what his words were. You've got to know which words he wrote, because if you wrote different words and you think, well, yeah, you change a word here and there, it probably doesn't matter much. And, and usually that's true, but it's not always true. I mean, what if you've got a hundred word paragraph and only one word is different, but it's the word not. <laughs> it's like if it's in some oh my god is it and so it really and so you need to you need to figure out what the deal is so scholars did not know about this that this was a big problem until the invention of printing when printing was invented um in the 15th century printers who wanted to print the bible had to decide which form of the bible do i print i mean there are no printed editions they're just copies by hand, handwritten copy. That's what a manuscript is, a handwritten copy. All you've got is, so how do you make a printed edition? Do you take one of the manuscripts and just like put that into print? Or what if that one has a lot of mistakes in it? Well, okay, do you find the best one you can find and you put that one into print? Or maybe you can figure out what the mistakes are and you correct the mistakes. Or maybe you find like 10 manuscripts and like you compare them and try and weed out the mistakes by comparing them with each other. And so you, you do that. In the early 18th century, as scholars were doing that, they started realizing, you know, there are a lot of differences in these manuscripts. So what do we do? In the year 1707, a scholar at Oxford named John Mill uh, produced an edition of the Greek New Testament. He looked at about 100 manuscripts. He'd examined them very, very closely. And he printed an edition of the Greek New Testament um, that looked kind of like uh, kind of like this, where you get the top of the page, which has a little bit, of, has some Greek text, which is the Greek New Testament. Then underneath, you got a place where the manuscripts show differences among themselves. The problem is the bottom part where the manuscripts are differences were in many ways more significant than the top part where the Greek text was. Mill, in these hundred manuscripts, found thirty thousand differences between the manuscripts the 100 manuscripts he'd looked at. 30,000 differences? This drove people nuts. Uh, I thought I had the word of God. Well, which one is it? Which of these 30,000, I mean, what's the right reading? And then, that, so that was in 1707. This is 2020. We don't have 100 manuscripts now. We have 5,800 manuscripts now. They had more than, he only had access to 100. And we have, as I said, 300,000 difference, 400, 500. How do you know what the original said? The old way of doing it was, look, you got, you got 2,000 manuscripts of Matthew and, uh, you know, 1,900 of them have one wording for this verse and 100 have another wording for this verse. Look, it's 1,900 to 100. That's 19 to 1. We're going with the 19. We're going with the 19. And so they decided to go with the 19. And that produced the kind of edition that we have lying behind the King James translation. The King James Bible used an edition kind of like that, that went with a text that was like the majority of manuscripts in the Byzantine period. Then scholars started realizing that all the manuscripts being discovered were not like that text. It's the early texts that were different from that one. And the church fathers are different from that one. And the early versions are different from that one. They start reasoning, huh, well, why is that? And they started realizing you can't just count manuscripts. Here's a reason you can't count the manuscripts. Suppose you've got an original. And suppose then you've got somebody makes two copies of that original, okay? And suppose the original gets lost. 
All right? So you've got manuscript A and manuscript B. Suppose manuscript A gets copied one more time. Suppose manuscript B gets copied nine more times. Okay? Suppose A and B get lost. So you've got the one copy of A and you've got the nine copies of B. Suppose the nine copies of B agree in the way word versus worded against the one of A. It sounds like that's nine to one, right? Sounds like you've got nine copies this way, one copy that way. So of course you go with a nine, of course you do. But it's not nine to one. It's one to one. This one comes from A, these nine come from B, and if B made the mistake, you'd have nine to one for the mistake. And it goes on like that for centuries. By the time you get down to the Byzantine period, where you get the 94% of our manuscripts um, uh, that I was talking about, the percentages I gave later, when you get down to those 94% of the manuscripts, they're all copying the same basic textual form. The fact that they're copying the same textual form doesn't mean that that textual form was the oldest form. How do you know what the oldest form was? Scholars in the 19th century, it started earlier than that, as uh, Jonathan pointed out, with people like Chris Bach. And, and you know, it, there's an old, old history of this. A, a guy, Johannes Bengel, and, and an, an Englishman, Bentley, and it kind of goes on. People were worried about all this in the 18th century. The 19th century got really serious. At the end of the 19th century, it got really serious. And people started realizing, look, the evidence is overwhelming. This person we've been talking about, Hort, who was one of my heroes when I was a graduate student, Fenton John Anthony Hort. I read his two-volume biography. It's fantastic. Um, he was a great scholar of the text, and he wrote a long book in company with his colleague Westcott, uh, Brooke Foss Westcott, and they showed why the Syrian or the Byzantine text was later. They mounted an argument, and the argument still stands today. The Byzantine text is not an early text, and you don't need to read all of Hort. Just, you know, I, you know I've said it a million times tonight, but uh, the reality is that this Byzantine text that, that Jonathan, Jonathan is arguing for is not found in any of our earliest witnesses. Yes, there's a lot of later witnesses. The fact that a lot of later witnesses have it doesn't mean that it's the original anymore, that the happy ending of Great Expectations is the original, even though that's what you find in all your copies. It's got nothing to do with whether it's the original or not. You've got to, find, you've got to do your research and find it out. I've spent uh, a good bit of my career studying the early text of the New Testament and studying um, how the text got changed over time. My PhD was on how the text developed in uh, the city of Alexandria uh, in the writings of Didymus the Blind. Uh, I, I've written, uh, written extensively on the early text of the New Testament and on the changes of the New Testament. And I can just say uh, that the evidence for the early, it's not that there's an early text and a later text. It's there's lots of textual forms earlier and there's a fairly consistent textual form later. But what everybody, virtually everybody in my field agrees on, who've done this kind of research I've done, I spent 20 years working on this, and I know people have spent 40 years working on this, and all of us agree, the Byzantine text is really interesting, it's really important, it's really significant for the Greek Orthodox Church, it is significant, but it's not the oldest form of the text. Most people are reading, who read that text are reading a form that is not like the original. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you very much, Bart, for that. Uh, that was like, wonderful. We now are going to pass the time for Jonathan uh, to present his response and closing statement. Also 10 minutes. Whenever you're ready, John. Okay. Well, thank you, Samuel. And, and once again, thank you, Dr. Bart Ehrman. Uh, you know, a lot of really great information and uh, really good discussion. I, I think we did go into uh, the details uh, a little bit, but uh, very interesting uh, discussion that we were able to have. Um, now, as we address tonight's question, have most churches had the wrong New Testament? Now, in order to address this problem, I would like to focus on the testimony of Augustine to answer necessary allegations and speak on the text state of affairs during the fourth and early fifth century. 
And one thing I do want to point out is, um, and uh, hopefully Dr. Irma will agree with me on this, is we're aware of variants. Augustine understood variants. He understands there were differences uh, in the text, in the different textual traditions, what we see in the Greek, what we see in the Latin. And what we're not saying is uh, um, that there aren't variants, there aren't scribal uh, variations. There weren't things taken out for theological um, reasons. We understand that we're dealing with human people who have obviously influences. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, 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 you know, dogmatics. But Augustine, in his discourse with the Manichaean luminary Faustus, Augustine and Hippo makes the following statement, specifically addressing a textual issue with uh, Faustus. He makes a statement, who would be so blind to passion as to deny the ability of the churches of the apostles, a community of brethren as numerous as they were faithful to transmit their writings unaltered to posterity, as the original seats of the apostles have been occupied by a continuous succession of bishops to the present day. Now, while we, the Christian churches had different churches throughout uh, the Roman Empire, what we see with the Aramaic churches, we have our Latin churches, we have our Greek churches. And while I'll definitely admit that in the fourth century, the text represented uh, at Antioch is obviously going to disagree with uh, Jerome's Vulgate and maybe what Augustine had in North Africa would, would also agree. Uh, there was this understanding that the form of government that was set up in the churches from the very beginning was an objective framework uh, to apply to textual criticism, as they did with Marcion. They appealed back to the polity that was set up in the churches as the framework for where our foundational text should be. Where are we going to find the best representatives of the text? Jerome understood coming into the fourth century, Christianity becoming legal. There were problems with the Latin translation, as Dr. Aramina pointed out in his letter to Damascus. This is what he wanted to do, bring about a new translation. But his comment specifically was he wanted to go back to the original form of the Greek, just like uh, textual scholars are doing today. Uh, he was obviously trained uh, with the Patriarch of Constantinople, Gregory. He was at that mass. That liturgy heard him speaking. Um, he obviously was uh, well aware of Didymus all over the ancient world. And he set out to do this as well. And the type of text represented uh, from Jerome, who had a full team and was also vetted against Augustine, they believe were the most faithful representatives of the text form. And what we see throughout history is this text form was ecclesiastically transmitted. And some of the problems I have with the theories, starting with Hort, uh, then moving down to Kenyon, and what we see in the modern scholarship is, while they all agree that the Byzantium text form is inferior, it's secondary, it's later, the theories or the premises that they are basing the inferiority of the Byzantium text have yet from what we've seen from uh, Bertzel, uh, looking back at Hort's theory, all these theories have sort of come apart. And when we see statements from Michael Holmes that says, we have a very incoherent view Question is, why don't we go back to what the churches said they did and how they preserved it? And why are we rejecting the church texts for texts that we can't establish the provenance of? And we know that documents from the ancient world included all different types of textual traditions that existed out there from the second century to the third century on up. Uh, what I set out to uh, discuss tonight is that the writings in the Fathers that we do see where they refer to these earlier forms is just, when we think about it, you don't start off as bishop. 
you have to start off with some text. That doesn't mean you get to walk into these official churches and get the text. We understand that the policy of the Roman Empire was looking for these texts. Uh, the Diocletian uh, persecution of the Christians went specifically after their texts. The churches knew they had to be very protective of it. The whole Donatist uh, heresy was about bishops who had turned over their texts during the Diocletian persecution, um, and they shouldn't be recognized anymore. So not only they had the polity, uh, but they took strong aims to preserve the texts. And what we see coming out of the three great witnesses of the ancient churches being the Aramaic, uh, we see with the Peshitta, we have another great witness there in the Vulgate, and what we see coming out of Antioch and Constantinople, churches that go back to the original, they would have been the successors of those copies. So the natural assumption is that this text form goes back. Uh, with that being said, I do want to thank uh, Dr. Ehrman for this conversation. It, it, it's been great. Uh, I do eventually want to find out if he was a 1928 or uh, a 79 edition of the Book of Common Prayer. But, 1928. Uh, <laughs> are you kidding me? Yes. <laughs> there we go. Um, but once again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ehrman for an excellent conversation. Obviously, there's uh, points that we disagree, but there's a lot that we do. Uh, and the argument I'm presenting uh, on behalf of uh, you know, the Anglicans that went before me, like Berger, Bergen, Miller, Scrivenger, Hoskier, um, and some of our Anglican uh, divines from the past, uh, hopefully I've been able to represent them well. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, for that. And also, uh, really thank you both, actually, very much, Bart, as well, for an amazing debate. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the close of the formal part of this debate. Uh, we are going to go to the uh, Q&A session in just a minute. And um, yeah, on behalf of S moderator, I just wanted to say I had a blast here. And James, uh, it's over to you, brother. Uh, I do have an announcement before we close, but we can do that right before we close. But I'll pass the time away over to you, James. Absolutely. Thanks so much. And I too have been thrilled about how well this has gone and the feedback from the live chat has been awesome. So thank you guys so much. We'll jump into those questions and want to let you know, folks, we've got a good amount of questions. And so it's probably going to be challenging to get through every single question, but we'll sure try. Just want to let you know, Samuel will also be reading questions from his stream. And so we're going to get started right now. Cystic to Strong, thanks for your question. Said, thank you both for doing this. This has been on my calendar for almost a month. Awesome. So thanks so much. Glad you enjoyed that, Cystic. Custer Survivors, thanks so much for your support as well. And SJ Thomason, thanks for your question. Said, Dr. Ehrman, do you still believe the core tenets of Christianity, such as the resurrection, have been well preserved, as you said in your second, but not third version of misquoting Jesus. I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. I, I haven't had three editions of misquoting Jesus. I've only had one edition. I, I'm not sure what the question is. Do you, can you say it again? I think it's asking whether, whether I think that the New Testament actually talks about the resurrection of Jesus originally. And the answer is yes, absolutely does. Yeah. Gotcha. I, Thanks so much. Not, I, I'm I frankly I'm trying to understand the question, but I'll keep an eye on the live chat if uh, SJ wants to clarify. Barry, Barry, yeah, thanks no. for your question as well. I'm, I'm sorry, James. I, I had my question actually was almost a similar question as SJ mm. had. Do you, do you mind if I just clarify Please that? Do. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So in the appendix of uh, misquoting Jesus, and I, again, I, I'm going to abuse my privilege as moderator for this one, so <laughs> I get to ask a question as well. Uh, uh, in the appendix of misquoting Jesus, page 252, uh, you, you talk about uh, your position being similar with that of uh, Dr. Bruce Matzke, and you say, end quote, um, the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. So I guess uh, my question is going to be a little bit similar to that of SJ. How should I respond, Dr. Ehrman, to non-Christians who tell me that my Bible is corrupted and I cannot trust the essential doctrines? it teaches well so two things one is um 
I, I don't think that any theologian or any Christian believer is going to have any of their major beliefs change because of uh, textual variants in the New Testament. And, the, and I've never said they would. And so I, I've always been a little bit surprised that people think that like I've changed my mind because I've never, ever, ever said that, that essential Christian doctrines were at stake. Um, because Christians don't make their doctrines based on a single word or a single verse. It, it's a compilation of the entire scriptures that help them and the tradition that they live in. The, and so we're not talking about that. But it, what strikes me as odd as well is that they think that, that therefore these kind of variants don't matter. <laughs> Look, there are lots and lots and lots of things that really matter a lot that don't affect essential doctrine. I mean, the, the one example I often give is if you woke up tomorrow morning and for some reason, every Bible on the planet now was missing the book of Jonah and Micah and Luke and Second Peter. Would that be significant? Oh, my God, that'd be significant. <laughs> Would it affect any essential doctrines? No. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, no. So I, I don't think, uh, you know, so I, I've never said that it, it would. And I, uh, so, yeah. So I had a second point, but I forgot what it was because I got so excited about the first point. <laughs> <laughs> so my, yeah, anyway, my question was how you would respond. How should I respond oh, 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 to someone? Oh, who said yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is the even more important point. This is more important. How do you respond <laughs> to somebody who says, therefore, you can't trust your New Testament? Or you can't trust what you didn't put it like that. You said trust the, the essential, essential doctrines. Look, the essential, whether you trust the essential doctrines, in my opinion, has almost nothing to do with textual variants in the New Testament. Knowing that the New Testament tells that Jesus got raised from the dead, you might not like to hear this, but my Anglican friend here might be happy with it. You, you would believe that even if you didn't have a Bible, because you're in a Christian <laughs> church, and that's what they say. So your, your belief isn't based, you do not believe in the Bible. And so the doctrine is either true or false, no matter what the Bible says. That's, that's my point. It's true or false. No, so the fact that there are variants in the Bible has no bearing on whether you should believe the essential truths of Christianity. No bearing. Zero bearing. And people seem to think it does because people are growing up fundamentalists and they think, well, if it's not in the Bible, it can't be true. <laughs> okay, well, you know, Newton's theory of gravity is not in the Bible either, but it's true. <laughs> the fact that something isn't in the Bible has nothing to do with whether it's true or not. And if it is in the Bible, that doesn't make it true. You have to figure out if something's true based on other things, not on whether it happens to be in the right textual variant or not. Sorry, I got carried away. James. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you, James. I passed the time back to you. <laughs> no problem. We'll jump Thank you, to... Dr. Ehrman. <laughs> Thanks, Barry Barry, for your question as well said, I enjoyed Dr. Ehrman's lecture series on how Jesus became God from a historical perspective. I am similarly interested in the historic origins of the Holy Spirit. Can Dr. Ehrman recommend or write any sources on this topic? Um, I, I haven't written anything on it, uh, although people have often asked me to. And it's a logical question because my book on how Jesus became God does try to explain where the Trinity came from. And it, the, the idea is that Jesus um, was not originally considered to be God during his lifetime, but eventually they did consider him God. But then you've got the other God, kind of like his father. And so you've got God the Son, you've got God the Father. And then, he's, and then Jesus says, well, this, you know, the Spirit's going to come after me, the Comforter, the, the Paraclete. And, and he's going to, so you got the Paraclete, you got the Spirit, you got God. You got the, so you got these three beings, and they're all God. And like, you only got one God. So how's that work? You got one God, you got three guys, you got one God. Yeah, okay, got, got them both. So, um, so the Spirit makes sense. I've never written on it. There's not nearly as much discussion about it in the early Christian sources, which is the reason I haven't really talked about it there's not a it is simply is not an issue in the period that i'm an expert in uh, which is basically up into the middle of the fourth century it just is not a burning issue in christianity and so i haven't dealt with it is there a good book about it well there might be but i don't know what it is <laughs> that's the kind of thing that i do with a with a how jesus became god like a regular old book for people trying to figure out how the spirit got into this i mean people like me can explain it but i don't know i don't know of a book on it you bet. Thanks Sorry. so much. And Jamie Russell, thanks for your question, said, so did the Byzantines uh, add parts to 
the original and when and who for Dr. Ehrman? When and who? Um, yes, there are, there, well, no, actually the, the surprising answer is kind of no. I mean, it's, it's, this is a tricky question. So the deal is, is that the, Byzant, the people who are creating the Byzantine text, um, when, when they are copying their text, they almost always are um, not inventing something new. They're almost always expanding based on the larger forms of the text earlier or changing on basis of the text earlier or omitting on the basis of texts earlier. They end up with this kind of distinctive configuration. It's kind of like saying, um, you know, you have like like you've got a uh, you've got a I don't know what you've got. You've got a scrapbook that has different kinds of pictures in it. And some people make different kinds of scrapbooks with the Byzantine editors they had they had the stuff available to them but they put it together in a unique configuration i don't know if that makes sense so it's not it's not that the byzantine text invented the story of the woman taken in adultery it's in a fifth century text um it's not that they invented the story of the last 12 verses of mark it's in earlier manuscripts it's you could go down the whole list but what's different is they put them all together into this configuration that's the byzantine text and so, no, uh, you know, they're using older elements. Uh, who and when? We don't have a who and when. That's the whole point. We don't have a who and when. I mean, um, just like we don't, we, don't have, I mean, we don't have a who and when for most of history, I'm afraid. <laughs> and yet history did happen. <laughs> you bet. Thanks so much. And language and programming, thank you for your question. Asks, does Dr. Ehrman still, be, still stand behind his thesis in orthodox corruption and elsewhere that it's impossible to establish the autographs due to a lack of MSS. Yes, I absolutely do. We don't know the originals. We can take very good guesses and we act as if we know the originals. But my view is that anybody who says we can know the originals doesn't understand our situation. Whoever wrote Mark's gospel uh, wrote it, Somebody copied it, somebody copied the copy, somebody copied the copy. We lost all those early copies. The first copy we have comes to us from about the year 220, and it's a it's a frag, it's got fragments of eight of the 16 chapters. We don't have a first complete copy of Mark till uh, probably 370 or so, the, the mid mid-fourth century. That's the first time we have a complete copy. So you say, well, we must have the original because you've got these thousands of manuscripts that say this. Well, yeah, but these thousands of manuscripts weren't all copied from the original. And so how do we know what the original said? What if the first copy of Mark made mistakes and the original got lost and then every other copy came from the copy that had mistakes in it? Then every copy would not go back to, it'd go back to the mistaken copy. And so how would you know? I'm saying we can't know. Can we give a pretty good estimate? Yes. Uh, can we be reasonably sure about most places? Yes. Are we sure about every place? Absolutely not. If we were sure of every, every place, there would not be a need for textual scholarship, and you wouldn't have hundreds of textual scholars disagreeing, because we would know. <laughs> the fact that scholars can't even agree, what does this verse say? You know, what, what, was this verse in there? Was it not in there? Was this verse? The fact they can't agree shows we don't know. You bet. Thanks so much. And Cystic to Strong, appreciate your question, said for both was the book of Revelation considered authentic early on, and what are our best sources for its rightful canonization? Jonathan, go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I, I think first off, uh, and, and we, we see these arguments um, kind of later on in history, we know that there was a lot of debate uh, with Revelation. We know the Patriarch of Alexandria did not like it. Uh, Eusebius had his views on Revelation as well. Uh, but we do see very early on, uh, Tertullian defends it um, as coming from, um, you know, John the Apostle himself. Uh, in his book against Marcion, Tertullian does appeal to the apostolic churches to say, we know the churches of John and the churches of John and the bishops that presided over those churches all independently witness uh, that John is the author. Uh, obviously, Irenaeus, who was from uh, Smyrna, 
uh, did have a lot of interactions with uh, Polycarp, who Tertullian says John appointed over that church, also uh, defended uh, Revelation as well. And, and the issue really comes up uh, later on in the in, in kind of the end of the fourth and uh, or in the fourth and in the fifth century. Uh, I know the the North African Church. Uh, responded specifically against uh, Pope Boniface, who rejected it in uh, the Council of uh, Carthage in 419, that says, you know, these are the texts that we receive from the fathers to be read in church. So the argument was, this is the text that had come down in our churches. And while we understand the issues, because even the Greek church, they kind of suppressed it from uh, the liturgies, uh, so th there, there were theological biases and views uh, against Revelation. But once again, we can trace that history to see where that comes in. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Ehrman uh, to speak on that matter as well. Yeah, so, I mean, the book of Revelation was he heavily disputed in the early church. Um, many people did not think it belonged. Some people thought it did belong. Many people thought the apocalypse of Peter should be in instead of the apocalypse of John. Um, in the third century, uh, an uh, a important figure in Alexandria wrote a, uh, a convincing argument that whoever wrote the book of Revelation, uh, this is Dionysius of Alexandria, did not, mm -hmm. whoever wrote the uh, book of Revelation did not write the Gospel of John. And so that's, that is the virtual consensus today among scholars of, of the book of Revelation. You just have to read the two in Greek. Whoever, whoever wrote John did not write the book of Revelation. These are very different books. But it is widely disputed. And, it, um, and Jonathan's right. Eusebius in the fourth century called it an antilegomenon, meaning it was disputed. Don't know whether he wasn't sure. And so um, it finally gets in at the end of the fourth century because it, uh, along with the book of Hebrews and, and some of the others that were kind of disputed. But uh, after the fourth century, there isn't that much debate about it. You bet. And Brandon Connell, thanks for your question, said, wouldn't any inconsistency prove it is wrong and shouldn't be followed as literal truth? I think that's maybe for Jonathan. Maybe kind of a challenge to inerrancy. Well, I, I, I do want to speak on that for a second as far as inerrancy, because they, they apply that to the original text. Now, as Dr. Ehrman pointed out, we don't have the original text. Uh, so the idea that we have the originals or uh, the inerrancy um, and what we find in the writings of the fathers is uh, infallibility, that uh, scripture won't lead you to error. Uh, and, and, and that was the historic position coming uh, down from the fathers. So uh, we understand there are variants. Uh, there is variants uh, in the Vulgate uh, <laughs> and the Byzantian text and the Peshito. Uh, there's obviously problems there. It doesn't have certain books, you know. So um, we understand that these differences uh, occur. And, you know, I, I always look back to Lorenzo Valla who really spawned the TR movement in my own uh, mindset because he looked at the Vulgate. He took four Vulgates. He took Greek texts. We know uh, Constantinople just got sacked. All the Greeks are coming over. And Lorenzo Valor, who saw a little hero of mine, you know, he looked and he noticed that there was these differences in the Western text and in the Greek text. And this prompted Erasmus and Cardinal Jimenez and this whole movement to correct this. So um, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to reconcile those differences. So is that destroying uh, uh, inerrancy? Well, uh, we don't have the originals. What we have is copies. And what we're trying to do is take the available copies we have. And even though Dr. Erna, Dr. Ehrman and I will disagree on what that foundational text is, here's what we're trying to do. This is what Jerome was trying to do. Cardinal Jimenez was trying to do, uh, Erasmus, and even the scholars of the King James were trying to do. So uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Ehrman so he can comment. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to answer too, because I, I would have, I have a different answer. I, you know, it sounds like this person is saying, look, if the Bible has an inconsistency in it, let's just throw it out. And I don't, I don't get that. I mean, you know, if you're talking to your friend and your friend contradicts himself about something, which happens, you know, roughly every day, does that mean you don't talk to your friend anymore? Like your friend has nothing to say because there was an inconsistency. I mean, if there is an inconsistency in the Gospels, and I think there are lots of inconsistencies in the Gospels, what that shows is that if you've got 
two reports of what Jesus did and they contradict each other, what it shows is that both of them cannot be true. One of them could be true or the other could be true or they could both be false. They both can't be true. But it's true about that particular point. You know, if you don't think of the Bible as like this inerrant revelation where every word has to be right, you know, if you think about that, that's fine. I mean, that's, you know, that's a that's a view of inerrancy that if you go that far, I mean, it's basically it's a fundamentalist view of the Bible, which is fine. You're happy. You, but, you know, it's going to get run into problems because of these inconsistencies. But you could have other views of the Bible and still believe in it. <laughs> and most people do and have throughout history. Most people have not held to the view of inerrancy. <laughs> I know, because I used to hold to it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. And language and programming, thanks for your question, said, I'm curious how Dr. Ehrman thinks Dr. Goodacre's thesis against Q stands up, namely that Matthew and Luke are just later extended redactions of Mark. Yeah, that's not quite his theory. But so Mark Goodacre is my colleague at Duke, and he does he doesn't believe in Q, which is the hypothetical source allegedly behind many of the sayings in Matthew and Luke that are not found in Mark. Uh, I think Mark Goodacre has made the very best possible case that uh, has been made in the history of the human race against Q. And I'm not convinced by it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I. Um, most scholars continue to think that there are aspects of the relationship of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that show fairly clearly that, um, that both Matthew and Luke copied Mark and also had access to a source we no longer have that they call Q. Um, but, um, you know, but, and so um, it's, it's not a big deal. His, his argument, by the way, isn't quite that. It's that it's Matthew copied Mark, Luke copied Mark, but Luke copied both Mark and Matthew. So it's, it's a little bit different. You bet. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. And S.J. Thomason with another question. Thanks, S.J. said, for Dr. Ehrman, were Peter, James, and Paul martyrs because they believe Jesus resurrected from the dead? Um, we don't know. I mean, um, you know, you always hear these people, you hear conservative Christians often say in an apologetic mode that all of the apostles were martyred for, because they believed in the resurrection. And, and nobody would die for a lie. Therefore, the resurrection must have happened because these people actually believed it. We actually don't know what happened to the vast majority of the apostles. Um, and so um, we have legends. We have, no, we have no accounts in the New Testament of... Uh, of um, I assume he's talking about James, the brother of Jesus, uh, and Peter, the disciple, and Paul. We have no record in the New Testament of any of their deaths. The first references to, rev to Peter and Paul's death is in a book called First Clement, which was written probably in the late 90s of the Common Era, so during the time of the New Testament. And he does mention that Peter and Paul got martyred. He doesn't say the reason for it. Uh, James, uh, there are all sorts of stories about how James died, one of which is that Paul killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so I don't. So that's the kind of level of legend we're talking. And the story that Peter got crucified upside down, and that Paul had his head that he got his head lopped off. Um, those come from later uh, apocryphal acts of the apostles, the acts of Peter, the acts of Paul. At best, at the end of the second century, we actually don't know. We I suspect that Peter and Paul probably uh, were martyred, but I don't know for a fact. You bet. Thanks so much. And let me make sure I try to pronounce this right. Helanthus, thanks for your question, said, for Dr. Ehrman, is there a happy ending sentiment in the version of the New Testament that you're arguing against that is analogous to the one in Great Expectations that would have contributed to its standardization? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, there's certainly additions that are like great expectations that are happy endings. I mean, the story of the woman taking an adultery, I mean, how good can you get? Go and sin no more, as opposed to being stoned to death. Well, that's a nice ending, and <laughs> we, sure, we sure like that one. But the Gospel of John was going to be canonized whether that story was in it uh, or not. The similarity with great expectations is that a lot of times, scribes will take something that is really kind of like disturbing and hard to understand, and they'll make it better. 
Uh, this has been recognized since the 18th century. Textual critics, uh, starting with especially uh, Johannes uh, Bengel, argued that if you've got you've got a verse worded two ways, and one way just is like, oh my God, really? And the other is like, oh, that makes sense. Then the oh my God, really is probably the original text, because which one is the scribe going to change? Is he going to change the one that makes sense and the one that's like, oh, really? Uh, just as an example, Mark chapter 1, verse 41, a leper comes up to Jesus, asks Jesus, please heal me. Uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, in the, t the common text says, Jesus, feeling compassion, reached out his hand, and says, "I'm willing, be healed," and he heals him. But in one of our old, very old manuscripts, it doesn't say that. It says the man comes up and said, "Please heal me," and Jesus, it says, Jesus, getting angry, said, "I'm willing, be healed." Ah, uh, getting angry at this poor leper? What the world? Well, yeah, well, of course, scribes wanted to change that one. I mean, it didn't make any sense. But so you do have, you know, kind of difficult things get changed into easier things all the time. But it didn't lead to this standardization, no. Thanks so much. And Laura Robinson, thanks for your question, said, question for both speakers, define in what sentence, <clears throat> I think it's maybe, define in one sentence what the, quote, right New Testament, unquote, is. Also, hi, Dr. Ehrman. Is this Laura Robinson from Duke? <laughs> <laughs> I probably know 20 Laura Robinson, so it sounds like uh, maybe this is a... Uh, I'll start because I have no good answer. What is the right New Testament? Um, I suppose what most people would say in the context of what we're talking about is the right New Testament is the one that's most closely representative of what the authors originally wrote. I, I think that's, I think that's it. Thanks so much. Uh, one sentence. So I, I would say it's the texts that have been ecclesiastically transmitted in the Greek, Latin, and Apostolic Church as the best representant representation of the earlier forms of the text. Uh, and now, for me, that you know would be the Syria Byzantium text form, the Latin Vulgate, uh, and the, the Peshitta. That bet. sentence had a lot of semicolons in it. I've just got to yes. say. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. And by the way, you were right, Dr. Herman. That was Laura Robinson from Duke. So. <laughs> She's trying to close those singers. She's a graduate student. She's like, what my students? What are you doing? <laughs> And then, uh, uh, we, I, I do have a question as well from explain side, but it can go after yours, James. Go ahead. You bet. This next one comes from James Snap, who asks, question for Dr. Ehrman. Does he think the <laughs> Peshitta, is it pronounced Peshitta? Pesh, Peshitta? Yeah, that's good enough. Was produced, <laughs> <laughs> was produced by Rabula? And, Rabula. Thank you. Story. And Clement of Alexandria's text of First Thessalonians looks Byzantine, doesn't it? Um, so, um, in response to the first question, uh, I don't think so, no. Uh, response to the second question, I don't know. Thanks so much. And Samuel. Thank you, James. Yeah, so we do have uh, uh, one question from Finding Truth. Uh, who says, uh, the question is for uh, Bart, uh, he says, how much um, percentage of the text can be reconstructed? Um, I guess that's the question, yeah. How much of the text can be reconstructed? Yeah, people ask that a lot. And the uh, answer is- percentage? we percentage? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, what percentage? Yeah. The answer is we have no idea. You know, it's funny because people will say things that just, they're crazy. I don't, and really smart people. I mean, really smart will say crazy things sometimes. And you got to kind of pay attention to what there's. People will frequently say things like, we, we have reconstructed 98% of the Greek New Testament. And what they mean by that is we, we know that 98% is exactly like the original. Well, tell me, how would we know that? The way you would know that one text is 98% the same as another text is if you've got both texts and you compare them word for word and 98 out of the 100 words are the same. That's how you know. That's how you do 98%. So you've got our text and you're going to show that it's 98% like what? What are you comparing it to to show that 98 out of 100 words are right? 
you don't have the other thing. And so it's a guess. I mean, you know, I'm I'm sure most most of what we've got in the Greek New Testaments used today, which are not which are not like the Byzantine New Testament, but the Greek New Testaments everybody uses today, uh, are um, the scholars use today, are really close in most places. But there are significant verses that vary. Some that matter a lot. Some that affect the entire meaning of a passage. Some that affect the entire meaning of a book. <laughs> I would ar- I would argue that that whether Here's, here's a surprising one. Did Luke, the Gospel of Luke, have a doctrine of the atonement? Did Luke think that Jesus' death was an atonement for sins? It hangs on a verse, two verses that are in sequence, whether they were in there or not. Pretty important. But it's only two verses, you know, however many verses are in Luke. So it's not, you know, most of Luke you can count on, but, you know, it's it's the ones you can't count on that you kind of wonder about. Right. We do have one more question from, uh, and this will be the last question from Explain Side, and then I'll pass it on to James. Uh, it's from um, it's from uh, Dr. Stephen Boyce. He says, uh, Polycarp said in chapter 3 of his epistle to the Philippians, and when absent from you, he, Paul, wrote you a letter which if you carefully study, you will find a means of building you up in that faith which has been given to you. Polycarp was early to mid-2nd century, and it appears that he assumes the church at Philippi still had the letter and could study it. What are your thoughts about that with the theory of copies of copies of copies, as if the church lost these readings or potentially lost these readings or lost control of the text? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, but I think I disagree with the premise a little bit. Um, I, um, I sometimes will say to my students, um, okay, you got, you know, you, you got your new Testament. So you've got, you've got your letter of the Romans, look it up. What does he say in chapter three, verse 12? I say, you've got the letter to the Romans. I don't mean they have the original copy. And so when Polycarp tells the uh, Philippians, you know, you've got Paul's letter. Of course they had Paul's letter, but it doesn't mean that they, that they're basing it on, he's not saying, he, they may have the original. Um, part of it has to do with when Polycarp lived. I mean, he's usually thought to have died around the year 155. There's a debate about his letter and about whether his letter is one letter or two letters and wh- how they date and all that. But however you count it, at earliest, uh, he said that about 70 years after the original of, uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, more like 80 years after the original of Philippians. Is it likely that 80 years after the original, the church is still using only the original? <laughs> I'd say absolutely not. <laughs> so, you bet. They might have it. You know. Thanks so much. And Carl Sagan, thanks for your super sticker. Appreciate the support. Carl Sagan? <laughs> wow. <laughs> this, one, this one's going to be really out of there. <laughs> and then James Snap, thanks for your question. They asked, for Dr. Ehrman, besides Mark 16 and John 7 through 8, what readings in the Byzantine text would you say have a meaning drastically different from the original? Um, So uh, the one I was just referring to would be a case in point. Um, It's the story of Jesus uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane um, where he's uh, sweating blood. In Luke's gospel, he is, uh, he is, um, uh, actually, this is a different one. Uh, I'm going to give you two. I'm going to do two real quick, both from Luke. This, in this one, Jesus is sweating blood. He's very disturbed, and he, he's all upset and, and bothered. An angel comes down and, and ministers to him. Uh, it's where we get the, where pe- the popular idea of sweating blood uh, comes from because he's so disturbed. It's the only two verses in Luke's entire narrative of Jesus' death, going to his death, where Jesus is upset. Unlike Mark, where he's upset all over the place. Uh, Luke has gotten rid of all of Mark's references to Jesus being upset because in Luke, Jesus is calm and collected going to his death. And he has no doubts about why he's doing it. He knows exactly why he's doing it. And he knows what's going to happen after he does it. And that's so different from Mark, where Jesus is in doubt and he wonders why God has forsaken him. And and he's distressed and his soul is sorrowful unto death. And all that's in Mark. Luke's changed all of that. Well, if those verses are original to Luke, 
then Luke hasn't changed all that. He's still got the same thing Mark does. If the verses are not original, then uh, then yeah. So they're in the Byzantine text, but they're probably not original in my opinion. About the atonement, it has to do with the Last Supper in chapter, uh, chapter 22, verses 19 uh, and 20. Does Jesus at the Last Supper in Luke's gospel say that the body, the bread represents his body that is broken for others and the cup of wine represents his blood shed for others or not? It's in the Byzantine text. It's not, it's, uh, it's not in many of the early texts. Was it originally there? If it wasn't there, Luke's gospel has gotten rid of all the other references to Jesus' death as an atonement from Mark. If it's not there, then Luke doesn't have, in my opinion, Luke doesn't have a doctrine of atonement. He still thinks the death is important, but the death does not bring an atonement for sins. It's Thanks, pretty so. important stuff. So we can, do, we can do this one all night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. And Lancer, thanks for your question, said, just got four infected wisdom teeth taken out today, but nothing could have made this night well other than wow. listening to Dr. Ehrman. Great debate. Hashtag Chapel Hill Pride. So Yes, go heels! <laughs> <laughs> so glad to hear that, Lancer. It's been a true pleasure indeed. And then James Snap, thanks for your other question, said, question for Dr. Ehrman, regarding John 7, chapter 7, verses 73 through John chapter 8, verse 11, doesn't the CY form of the OL cap capitula show that the PA was already in the text of John after 753 in the 200s. I could put that in the, uh, I don't know if you... Yeah, no, I, I got it. And um, the man you... I'm sorry, I wasn't following. It's 737. He's talking about the woman taking an adultery. The PA is the pericope adulteri. The, so he's asking, doesn't this show that the woman taking an adultery was already in the text in the second century? Uh, almost everybody answers that question, no. The, man, the manuscript he's talking about is not a second century manuscript. And so I don't know uh, why, why he would think. James Snap is a, is a, is a scholar of, of the text and so he uh and but he has a view i think more along the line of jonathan's view um he um but no i don't i don't see why that puts it in the second century it certainly doesn't put in the majority of the second century it doesn't show up until codex bise <laughs> so as he knows huh. well actually thanks so much and then we uh this is our <laughs> last let's see so thanks so much, and we appreciate you going over time for us as we've, we've gone over the 30-minute mark. We want to remind everybody, first, want to let you know, I've linked all of the speakers down in the description. So if you'd like to hear more from any of them, hey, great time to go down there and click on their links. Want to say thanks so much for Explain Apologetics. Samuel Nassan, who you're seeing on the bottom right of your screen, folks, we totally appreciate his collaborating with us for this event. And also want to say thanks so much to our speakers, of course, Jonathan Sheffield and Bart Ehrman. It's been a true pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us. May I say something? May Absolutely. I say something? Uh so I, I appreciate, you know, the link and all. I want people to know about my blog. Jonathan, you get your free, you get your five seconds too. I want people to know about the Bart Ehrman blog where I talk about this kind of stuff all the time. I post five times a week uh, every for the last eight and a half years on everything related to the New Testament, early Christian, not just textual, but like the whole thing of the history of Christianity up to Constantine. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, check out the Bart Ehrman blog. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was actually going to bring that up uh, because I, I know you just recently launched your new blog and uh, it has some really interesting. Uh, I have some friends in the Anglican Communion that were asking about it, too, uh, for the upcoming debate. But, uh, yeah, very, very, uh, very good. Um, as far as myself, everyone knows where they can find me on my YouTube channel uh, out here on Modern Day Debate uh, or with Samuel Nissan. Um, but uh other than that, I definitely thank Dr. Ehrman for having this conversation and at least getting to uh, understand maybe the problems that I have uh, with uh, with this field in general. But uh, it, it's been a pleasure. Great, thanks. Before, Me too, Jonathan. Thank you. Now, before I do pass, before I do go back to, uh, I mean, James, I do have an announcement. James, if that's all right. Absolutely. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, the announcement we have is that if you've enjoyed this debate, we're actually going to have a review of this debate. Uh, that's coming up on Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern. For those of you in the United States, I repeat, Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern. I will get, uh, if, if James is all right with it, I will request James to put the link to that in the mm -hmm. description box of this video, if he's agreeable to it. Uh, but uh, we will have a review of this debate together with Dr. Stephen Boyce, and we may have another panelist. Uh, we'll update on that as well. That's going to be 9 p.m. Eastern this Sunday, a review of this debate. And for those of you watching in Asia, uh, it's going to be 9 a.m. Monday morning. So, and on my part, I, I, I've i been the, the person really liaising with both Jonathan and uh, Dr. Ehrman, and uh, I have to say it's been fantastic getting to know Bart, and of course, Jonathan, I knew him way before this. It's, he's been so kind. Bart has been so kind uh, in everything that uh, our exchanges and all that. So thank you both very much. And I'm also, this has been a great privilege for me to be doing this alongside James. Uh, James and I go back to a long time. In fact, he's been to Malaysia as well. We've spent time there in Malaysia together. Uh, wonderful doing this with you, James. And thank you very much for this. I pass the time back to you. Thanks so much. My pleasure. And want to remind you folks, I don't know if I, I think I mentioned up front, but I have to mention again, I put Samuel's link to explain apologetics in the link or in the description. And so I would encourage you, if you enjoy debates, folks, they have a lot of debates with top, like just epic historians. So I highly encourage you, a lot of scholars in different fields, highly encourage you to check out explain apologetics, Samuel's link in the description. I've also Bart Ehrman's blog that he had just mentioned, that's in the description as well right now. So those links are waiting for you. And then last, but certainly uh, we want to let you know, folks, no matter what walk of life you come from, Christian, atheist, or one of the many strange creatures in between, we want to say thanks so much for <laughs> hanging out with us here. We appreciate it. And if it's your first time here and you love debates, hit that subscribe button as we have many more coming up. And with that, we are going to go off the air on our side. So thanks so much, everybody. And keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Have a great rest of your Friday.